Who, the chancellor? Oh. The chancellor's here. Okay, I've got some triplets that take triplets. Good enough cake. Yeah. Players there. I don't see the coach. What's that? Are you reading tonight? <clears throat> Am I reading tonight? One of the proclamations? I don't believe so. Not unless the mayor surprises me. I wouldn't put it past him. But... Should I have someone open that for me? Is there a white powder going to come out of it? Just a letter. Oh, I'm okay with you. I accept that. That means I love people. I don't think that's what it means, actually. I guess that's what it means. I don't think that's what it means. I guess what it is what it means. I don't think that's what it means. I have no idea. We're reading tonight. Anything past that? I don't know right up here. I don't know right up here. When we read the names of the folks, if you recognize the names of the folks. I don't know. I don't recognize them. Allison is here. I did. I voted. I don't remember right up here. There are some. The buttons. There are some. Not all of them. All right. It's good to see you. I know the mic's on. Huh? There he is. He's here. Mr. Mayor, the Chancellor told me the coach, coach is in route. Oh, he is. Oh, okay. You read my mind. Coach. Doing the old genius now. So good. Hey. Good evening. I'd like to call this meeting of the Durham City Council to order. Seven o'clock, Monday night, April the 16th. And we certainly want to welcome all of you all in attendance. <clears throat> I will ask you all now to please pause with me for a moment of silent meditation. Thank you. And now I'll ask Councilmember Reese to please lead us in the Pledge to the Flag. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Those of you in the audience, if it's your practice to do so, and if you're able, please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Man, the kids really picked up the pace on it, didn't they? You guys were great. Thank you very much. Really kept Madam it. Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shul? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson? Here. Councilmember Alston has requested an excused absence. Councilmember Caballero? Here. Councilmember Freeman? Present. Councilmember Middleton? Here. And Councilmember Reese? Here. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to now uh, ask for, uh, as, as you all know, uh, Councilmember Alston's plane is delayed en route. We hope she will make it, uh, but uh, I'm going to ask now if someone will move that we please give her an excused absence. So moved, Mayor. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we give Councilmember Austin an excused absence. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to deviate a little bit from our usual uh, order of business tonight. We are uh, going to do the ceremonial items as we usually do. Uh, then we're gonna do the prior items by the city manager, city clerk, city attorney and city clerk. Then we will read the consent agenda and after that we will come back to announcements by the council since we could have some lengthy discussion at that point. Um, so first I will 
begin, though, with our ceremonial items. And I'm going to ask Council Member Mark Anthony Middleton if he will do the honors uh, with the first one. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and to esteemed colleagues. Good evening, fellow citizens, residents, and guests. Welcome to your city council chamber. Uh, Mr. Mayor, this is my first time since being elected uh, doing a proclamation, and I can think of no better one to cut my teeth on than to honor the championship North Carolina Central University men's basketball team for their brilliant victory in the <laughs> Are there any Eagles in the house? I'm going to ask if Chancellor Dr. Johnson Oakenleye would come up and Coach Lavelle Moten, my friend and the whole squad. All you short guys, get down front here with me. <laughs> Stand right behind him. <laughs> the proclamation reads as follows. Whereas North Carolina Central University is one of America's leading historically black colleges and universities and is an in integral part of the very fiber of Durham, as a strategic partner for the educational, economic, and cultural advancement of the city. And whereas the North Carolina Central University's men's Division I basketball team won the 2018 Mideastern Athletic Conference MEAC Tournament Championship for the second consecutive season after topping number one seed Hampton 71 to 63 inside the Norfolk Scope Arena. And Whereas, with the victory, the Eagles earned a bid into the NCAA tournament while capturing its third tournament title in five years. And, whereas North Carolina Central's head coach, Lavelle Moten, was named the tournament's most outstanding coach. And, whereas Pablo Rivas, the tournament's most outstanding performer, delivered a championship performance, finishing with 22 points on 8 out of 13 shooting off the bench. And whereas Rashawn Davis and Pablo Rivas are included in the tournament's all-tournament team, and whereas while the Eagles played valiantly against its opponent, they experienced an end to an impressive season, finishing with a 25-9 record. And whereas their journey to the 2018 NCAA Division I tournament, from selection show celebration to the matchup with Texas Southern in the NCAA First Four in Dayton, Ohio, and Whereas collectively this team will long be celebrated for its excellence, athletic prowess, and the enormous sense of pride it brought to alumni, fans, and the larger community of North Carolina Central University. Now, therefore, on behalf of the Durham City Council, I do hereby salute Chancellor Johnson O. Akinleye, Coach Lavelle Moten and his staff, and members of the 2018 North Carolina Central University men's basketball team for winning the MEAC championship and for its third appearance in the NCAA tournament and call upon all citizens in the city of Durham to join in saluting these outstanding athletes and the NCCU athletic staff for a job well done. We are confident in a bright future for this program and can't wait until next season. Witness my hand in the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina, this 16th day of April 2018. It is signed Stephen M. Shule, Mayor of Durham. too long. I know you guys have some um, lengthy discussions that need to take place, but um, on behalf of North Carolina Central University, 
I want to thank you guys, Mr. Mayor, and everyone else. And just the city of Durham, there's too many people to name. But thank you for your support. Um, thank you for your love. Thank you for your uh, representation. We're proud to be extended part of this community and represent you all as best that we possibly can. I have the best job in the world because what constitutes a great job is not only is this my alum, but I, I work for this guy right here. So Chancellor is the most incredible human being ever. And secondly, and last but definitely not least, I probably get a lot more credit than I deserve because I, I haven't scored a bucket or contributed. I didn't play any defense. I'm kind of too old to do that. And these guys right here allow me to uh, yell at them and stand in the suit on the sideline and they go out there and execute. So this award is strictly for them. So give them a round of applause. For me. Thank you all, and um, we did it back to back, so we look forward to being here uh, next year. <laughs> Mr. Mayor and the council members and the citizens of uh, Durham, we won't take much of your time tonight. I simply just want to echo what our coach has already said. Um, I want you to know that North Carolina Central University is a part of this city, and we appreciate the integration. We appreciate your love and support for our institution and for this very great team. And we thank you tonight for this proclamation, and uh, we are grateful. Uh, for your support. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Chancellor, we are <clears throat> all looking forward to your installation this week. We're all very excited about it. So thank you for being here. So now we have an, another uh, very, very special, um, special presentation. I think that I might, though, wait just a minute and allow other people who want to come in to do that because this presentation is going to need everybody's attention. We're just going to wait a minute till we get the seats all filled up so everybody can be in here to hear you guys. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, and I want to appreciate our fire marshals for doing such a good job with a big crowd. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so now we have a very special entertainment I'm very excited about. A few weeks ago, I got invited out to read in the Media Center at Spring Valley Elementary. And while I was out there, I had the good fortune to be reading to an exceptional group of third grade students. And they seem to have appeared in the first two rows here at Durham <laughs> City Hall 
<laughs> with their teacher, Ms. Alicia Morris, and um, they, while I was there with them, they did a very special pledge, which I thought was really amazing. And so I asked them to come to City Hall and do it for all of us. Ms. Morris, I'm gonna ask you to come up now and your students so you can put them wherever you want and come up here and say a few words to us, okay? Good evening, my name is Alicia Morris and I'm a third grade teacher at Spring Valley Elementary School. Mayor Shul has graciously invited my third grade class and I to recite our pledge. I would like to take the time to acknowledge Turquoise Parker, a second grade teacher at Eastway Elementary for creating this pledge. We appreciate you for sharing your words of wisdom with us. Since the beginning of the school year, we take time during our morning meeting to say our pledge and affirmation. These serve as a daily reminder for my students to understand that their education holds a purpose for their future. They know that if they take an active role and responsibility for their actions and learning, they will have the power to achieve any goal they, they set their mind to in order to be successful Durham leaders. So please help me in welcoming my third grade students up to them. Job, guys. Ms. Morris and students, fabulous job. And we know you're going to do all of those things. So thank you all for being here. And Ms. Morris, I also want to thank the other staff members from Spring Valley who came to support you and the parents. Good job, parents. Well done. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Again, we're going to pause and, and let some more people in. Folks, we're just trying to let as many people in as we can, so thanks for your patience.
Thank you very much. Again, I want to thank our fire marshals. We appreciate you. Uh, is Lisa Richmond here? Lisa, great. Uh, my council colleague, Charlie Reese, is going to read the recognition for our neighborhood spotlight tonight, uh, Lisa Richmond. But let me just say that Lisa is one of those neighborhood champions who make Durham a better place every day. She is a truly amazing neighborhood advocate. And uh, I'm really glad that Charlie was going to be honoring her tonight with the neighborhood spotlight. So, Charlie. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate that. I just wanted to also mention that my daughter is, is a third grader at Hope Valley Elementary. Uh, but when those uh, third graders are doing that pledge, I'm not ashamed to say I got a little dusty in here. Anybody else? It was <laughs> amazing. Uh, but enough about that. Let's talk about the Neighborhood Spotlight Award. Um, tonight we're honoring Lisa Richmond, who's the recipient of the Neighbor Spotlight for the month of April 2018. The Neighbor Spotlight Award recognizes community members that have gone above and beyond in volunteering their time to serve their community. This month, Lisa Richmond, a resident of the Birchwood Heights community, was nominated and selected because of the wonderful work she has done in her neighborhood, including but not limited to coordinating the volunteers of the Birchwood Heights Community Center for programming, including a community garden, exercise classes, mentoring, a food pantry, and a computer lab, organizing neighborhood events and meetings, including national night out and health information workshops and conducting door-to-door -door outreach and sharing information with neighborhood residents. Congratulations to Ms. Richmond on being the April's Neighbor Spotlight for the City of Durham, and thank you for all the work you do to improve our Durham community. And if there are any residents that have shown up in support, you can stand now. Congratulations, Ms. Richmond. I'm going to call on uh, Mayor Pro Tem Jillian Johnson to uh, make the, the final uh, presentation tonight uh, for the Sunday Supper Durham Day. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. So are, is um, James Glenn, Keith Daniel, and Harris Vaughn here? Okay. And some others. Great. Whereas the city of Durham faces a one million pound shortage of food annually, with nearly one fifth of citizens and one in four children considered food insecure, living without a sufficient supply of food. And whereas healthy food is essential to children's performance in school and adults' capacity to work effectively and provide for their families, and critical to families' abilities to pull themselves out of poverty. And whereas Durham's current food distribution system lacks the additional capacity to collect, store, and distribute food to meet our one million pound shortfall. And whereas food insecure citizens are not fully aware of the many programs and resources designed to help provide the assistance they need. And whereas Catholic Charities, which has provided food and other key services in the Durham community for more than 25 years, plans to build the Durham Community Food Pantry that will provide 1.5 million pounds of food each year by 2021. And whereas In Hunger Durham, through their information station and other methods, reaches food insecure citizens with information helpful to meeting their critical needs. And whereas community organizers are planning the Sunday Supper Durham event on April 29, 2018, to raise critical funding to support ch Catholic charities and End Hunger Durham, as well as other worthy organizations working to address Durham's food insecurity needs. And whereas the Sunday Supper is designed to bring people together to break bread, give thanks, and help neighbors in need. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shule, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim April 29, 2018, as Sunday Supper Durham Day in Durham, and hereby urge the residents of Durham to support this important event. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, and thank you, Mayor Shule, City Council, fellow citizens of Durham. We're honored to be here. We have a fantastic opportunity ahead of us in fighting food insecurity. That's why our team is here. That's why we have spent so many hours working with so many of you in our community to have the Sunday Supper Durham. 
And what this will be is a gathering of people underneath the water tower at American Tobacco Campus on Sunday, April 29th, from noon until 3 p.m. For a very small fee, you get all the food you can eat, everything you want to drink, and some great entertainment. So we, our intent is to bring and unify Durham together as much as we can for an hour, have people sit across the table from one another, get to know somebody you don't know, and there's magic in that. There's some healing in that. And at the same time, we will raise some crucial funds for Catholic Charities' new Durham Food Pantry, as well as Under Hunger Durham. These organizations are great. They are helping the citizens of Durham, and that's what we're about. We just want to help unify Durham, and please check out www.sundaysupperdurham.com. We'd love for you to volunteer or just attend and enjoy. Thank you for your time, and thank you for the proclamation, Mayor Shule. Now on to the fun stuff. We will have now the, uh, I'll now ask the um, city manager, Mr. Manager, any priori priority items tonight? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Good evening, everyone. I have one priority item this evening, uh, which is agenda item number 16 of the utility extension agreement with the Miracle League of the Triangle Incorporated to serve the Miracle League at American Tobacco. We request that this item be referred back to administration. Thank you very much. Can I have a motion on the manager's priority item? So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? If not, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. <clears throat> motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much. Madam Attorney, any priority items tonight? Uh, no, you're, no, Mr. Mayor, um, I'm Kimberly Raber, Senior Assistant City Attorney. Obviously, I'm not Patrick Baker, and Mr. Baker has not informed me of any priority items. Thank, Thank you very much. Madam Clerk, any priori priority items tonight? Good evening, Mayor and Council. I have no items. Thank you very much. As I said earlier, before we do announcements, uh, we're going to do the consent agenda. Um, The consent agenda uh, can be approved with a single motion by the council. And any item can be removed from the uh, consent agenda by any council member or any member of the public. And then we would take that item up at the end of the meeting. So I'll now read these items. Item one, approval of city council minutes. Item two, Durham City County Appearance Commission appointments. Item three, City County Committee on Confederate Monuments and Memorials appointments. Item four, Contract Administration and Change Order Performance Audit dated March 2018. Item six, 2017 Planning Commission Annual Report. Item seven, 2017 Durham Environment Environmental Affairs Board Annual Report. Item eight, 2017 Durham City County Appearance Commission Annual Report. Item nine, 2017 Historic Preservation Commission Annual Report. Item 10, 2017 Durham Open Space and Trails Commission Annual Report. Item 11, 2017, Durham Board of Adjustment Annual Report. Item 12, Supplemental Agreement with North Carolina Department of Transportation, the City of Durham for the R. Kelly Bryant Bridge Trail Project. Item 13, Grant Agreement with North Carolina Department of Transportation and the City of Durham for the Third Fork Creek Trail Extension Project. Item 14, Proposed Five-Year Lease with Hanson Aggregate Southeast LLC for the Tier Quarry at 5090 Denfield Road. Item 15, Acceptance of the Donation of Public Art Sculptures from Trinity Park Foundation. Item 16, utility extension agreement with the Miracle League of the Triangle. I'm sorry, that was the item that we have referred back to the administration. Uh, item 19, adoption of the downtown master plan updates. Items 21 through 28, these items can be found on the general business agenda public hearings. Council members, you've heard the consent items. 
Can I have a motion for their approval? Move it on. Mr. Mayor, I'll move the consent agenda. A second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? If not, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. The consent agenda passes 6-0. Thank you very much. We are now going back to the announcements portion of our agenda. And that, after we do the announcements and discussion related to one of the announcements, we will uh, then go to our public hearing items. Let me, there is one, uh, as you all know, there is already one announcement by the council uh, that uh, is the discussion of the Council statement on international police exchanges. But we are beginning today with another announcement that I'm going to make, and, and we may have other announcements by the Council as well. As you all, many of you know, there were arrests in Durham this past week uh, by the United States Immigration and Customs Agency. And I made a statement uh, earlier in the weekend about this with the assistance of my council colleague, Javiera Caballero, and she has been doing a lot of work on this over the last few days. And we have another statement that we're going to make tonight. Uh, I, will be, I will be reading the statement in English and she will be reading the statement in Spanish. Actually, we're going to do it the other way around. She's going to be reading it in Spanish, and I'll be doing it in English. We are not taking comments on this today. It was not pre-announced on our agenda, uh, but I think you will get the import of what we have to say. So, Javier, I'll turn it over to you and uh, for your remarks and uh, for reading the uh, statement. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just uh, really quickly, it has been a hard few days in our state. Ha sido muy difícil estos últimos días acá en Durham y también en Raleigh y Asheville y Chapel Hill. Um, el cuento que les voy a decir esta noche es una mujer que nos pidió que se quería quedar anónima y es por eso que no voy a hacer su nombre. De acuerdo con la primera información recibida el jueves 12 de abril cerca de las 7 de la mañana, ocho agentes federales de la Agencia de Inmigración y Control de Aduanas de los Estados Unidos, ICE, aparecieron en un complejo de departamentos donde viven muchas familias latinas. Estaban buscando a una persona específica que ya tenía órdenes de deportación contra él. Una residente de Durham, que también es una mamá de un niño joven, escuchó ruido afuera de su departamento y abrió la puerta para ver lo que estaba pasando. Los agentes de ICE inmediatamente y agresivamente forzaron la entrada del departamento. Los residentes adentro de la habitación eran la mujer, su hermano, su niño de 18 meses, dos amigos de la familia, un niño de 16 años que era el hijo de uno de los amigos y tres personas más que vivían en el departamento. Todos estaban dormidos. Los agentes los despertaron bruscamente y les gritaron que presentaran su identificación. Cuando la mujer pidió permiso para ir a buscar a su bebé, no le dejaron. El hermano fue detenido y también uno de sus amigos. La mamá no fue detenida porque su niño era tan joven pero los agentes de ICE tomaron fotos de su pasaporte. Desde ese día, la mujer nos ha dicho que se siente muy culpable de haber abierto la puerta y que está muy tra traumatizada con su experiencia. Se siente muy sola y desprotegida y ha sabido que su hermano, quien era el proveedor de su familia, fue transferido al Stewart Detention Center, detención que está en Lumpkin, Georgia. 
Este tipo de escenario se ha manifestado a través del área del triángulo y al final de la semana pasada y en Asheville durante el fin de semana, donde personas fueron detenidas en casos que se llaman daño colateral, como el hombre en Chapel Hill que detuvieron cuando estaba sacando su basura. Una persona agradada por ICE, muchas veces la persona que los agentes, no es la persona que los agentes están buscando. Y desafortunadamente son agradados porque ICE está operando con un alcance mucho más amplio bajo la actual administración federal. Cuando estos eventos se estaban desarrollando, el gerente de la ciudad de Durham confirmó con la jefa de policía, jefa CJ Davis, que nosotros no recibimos notificación previa de las actividades. Además, yo personalmente confirmé, confirmé con el aguacil Mike Andrews que su departamento, departamento tampoco recibió notificación previa de las actividades. Como alcalde de la ciudad de Durham, condeno estos arrestos en los términos más enérgicos posibles. Acogemos a todos los residentes de Durham, sin importar el estado de, la, de, de su doc documentación y no queremos que ICE tenga un gran, gran temor en nuestra comunidad. Yo creo que fuera de las obligaciones morales y éticas para darles la bienvenida y, y cuidar a nuestros vecinos más vulnerables, la comunidad inmigrante de Durham tiene un impacto enorme cultural, social y económico en nuestra ciudad. El éxito de nuestra ciudad está relacionada a su éxito y su habilidad de estar seguro y vivir sin miedo. Les pido que donen a los fondos legales programados para ayudar a nuestros residentes en detención y finalmente a nos, nuestros inmigrantes. Les quiero decir que te queremos y tu lucha es nuestra lucha. Durham is a city that is about to be 150 years old in a year. And I believe that was the first speech given from this podium aside from my occasional lousy Spanish, uh, in Spanish. Uh, and I think that's a landmark moment in itself, and we need to be very appreciative of it. I'm now going to read this statement that uh, Councilmember Caballero and I worked on together uh, in English. According to firsthand accounts, on Thursday, April 12th, around 7 a.m., eight federal agents with the United States Immigration and Customs Agency, ICE, appeared at an apartment complex where many Latinx families live. They were looking for a specific person who had deportation orders against them. A Durham resident who is the mother of a small child heard noises outside of her apartment and opened the door to see what was happening. And as soon as the door was opened, the ICE agents forced their way into the apartment. The residents in the apartment were her brother, her 18-month-old child, two family friends, the 16-year-old son of one of the family friends, and three more people who lived there as well. Everyone was sleeping, the apartment residents were roughly awakened, and ICE officials demanded they present identification. The woman's brother was detained, as was one of the family friends. The mother was not detained because of her young child, but ICE agents took pictures of her different IDs. The woman has since shared She feels guilty for having opened the door and is traumatized by her experience. She feels isolated and alone and has learned her brother, who was the provider for their family, has been transported to the Stort Detention Center in Lumpkin, Georgia. This type of scenario played out across the Triangle late last week and in Asheville over the weekend, where people are detained in what are called collateral damage cases. Like the man in Chapel Hill who was detained last week while taking out his garbage, a person seized by ICE is often not the person agents are looking for but unfortunately are caught as ICE operates with a wider net and broader scope under the current federal administration. As these events were unfolding, our city manager, Tom Bonfield, confirmed with Durham's Ch police chief, C.J. Davis, 
that we did not receive prior notification of planned ICE activities. In addition, I personally confirmed with Sheriff Mike Andrews that our Sheriff's Department received no prior notification of the ICE actions as well. As mayor of the city of Durham, I condemn these arrests by ICE in the strongest possible terms. We embrace every Durham resident, regardless of documentation status, and we do not want ICE striking fear in our community. I believe that beyond the ethical and moral obligation to welcome and take care of our most vulnerable neighbors, the immigrant community in Durham has a huge positive economic, social, and cultural impact on our city. Our city's success is tied to their success and their ability to thrive and to live free from fear. I ask you to donate to the legal funds set up to assist our residents in detention. Finally, to our immigrant community, I want to say you are loved and your fight is our fight. Thank you very much. Council members, any comments? Any for any comments about that that anyone else would like to make? Uh, uh, Council Member Freeman, and then Mayor Pro Tem. I, um, I had to write it down because I know it would probably get too um, elaborate. I just want to thank the mayor and Council Member Caballero for taking the lead and setting up this statement so that we um, could say something about this. I just want to add to this conversation and, the, um, and to thank um, the El Centro for making this point today that we spoke about it and uh, Pilar Rocha Goldberg specifically. I, um, as a member of, East Durham, of the East Durham community, have experienced a lot of family, I'm sorry. <laughs> Take your time, you're good. Being shattered by what? I'm just gonna read what I wrote because for as long as we're gonna treat our immigrant community as criminals, based on our country, state, county, and municipal system, we have to call out the immorality of the enslavement of, of these human beings, as well as the fear-mongering that is occurring. It is completely unacceptable to participate in a system that would break families apart like this. And I can't say enough that it is the children who suffer the most in this. And I cannot bear, I can't bear to continue to go through this every time with each family. We have to do something, enough is enough. I recognize that this is a system that we must operate in, but we have to do something. And I'll leave it at that, thank you. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I wanted to also thank the Mayor and Council Member Caballero for this statement and to also bring into the conversation um, that while these raids leading to deportations are incredibly traumatic and, um, and dramatic in the community, we're also dealing with a situation where people are being pushed into, into deportation every day um, by being arrested for minor um, criminal violations that lead them into deportation proceedings because our county jail continues to cooperate with ICE and to, um, and to honor ICE detainers. We don't have to do that. Um, a lot of people, immigrant rights advocates and lawyers believe that it's unconstitutional to hold people beyond, um, beyond the, the timeline that they are constitutionally allowed to be held in jail based on a request from another, from another agency. Uh, and there have been a number of people who have been deported as a result of um, being held in the jail on ICE detainers in Durham, from the Durham County Jail. So I just wanted to bring that concern um, as well into the room as something that we in our local community have direct control and direct influence over. Um, we, our federal government, um, it's, it's hard to 
it's hard to think about ways that we can influence our, our federal policy right now. I think we just have to, as a community, stand together and support people as best we can, people who are in sanctuary here, people who need our help. Um, but our local policies, we do have, have more control over and we do have more of a say. Um, and that's something that we can all be thinking about when we're um, thinking about how to support our immigrant friends and neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Councilmember Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to thank you and uh, Councilmember Caballero. I know that the two of you spent a lot of time uh, on this issue uh, late last week and over the weekend. Mr. Mayor, I know you were traveling, uh, and so the, the burden was a little bit more difficult for you. I also want to thank uh, Councilmember Caballero especially uh, for making uh, the statement that the two of you worked on um, available in Spanish and delivered first in Spanish. I think that's really important. Uh, as we go forward on this issue, uh, because it's an issue that affects our Spanish-speaking neighbors, especially hard uh, in our community, as, um, as Council Member Freeman so uh, eloquently told us about. Um, I just wanted to underline a couple of things before we moved on to other matters. Um, one of the reasons that these types of raids are so scary uh, is that they're out of our control, and we have no idea if or when uh, they will happen again in the future. Uh, but one thing we do have the ability to control is whether or not we speak out on behalf of our neighbors who are uh, being uh, targeted uh, by federal agents in this way. And so I, I truly appreciate, uh, your, Mr. Mayor, your willingness to be very vocal in support of our uh, immigrant neighbors. Uh, I want to make sure that everyone knows that every member of this council um, wants Durham to be a welcoming place uh, for all people. We want all of our neighbors to stay right here. Um, the other thing I wanted to do is just underline uh, briefly the Mayor Pro Tem's remarks about uh, ICE detainers in our local jail. Uh, as she mentioned, um, many, uh, there are a number of courts around the country who have, who have ruled that uh, local jails aren't required to honor these, uh, these federal detainers. Uh, there's also been litigation around the question of funding, um, and courts have held that the federal government cannot withhold funding uh, of agencies that uh, do not honor these detainers, and so uh, I hope that's something that will continue to be part of our conversation uh, here in this community as we talk about how we can stand up uh, for the folks who are most vulnerable to these types of uh, federal overreach actions. And just again, thank you for all that, Mr. Mayor, all the time that you've put into this issue, and I hope we can figure out some way to protect one another going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. All right. I just want to say one last thing. Of course. Um, I want to say that when one of the things that is the most helpful in our community, and many of our grassroots activists do this, is when you see suspicious activity. Uh, unfortunately, ICE agents often just wear things that say police, and so there is confusion. But I know that when it's reported, when it's shared out, I know in Asheville that was very, very tremendously helpful to get the word out so that people stay home. Um, they know not to drive in that part of town. And so I ask all of you to please be vigilant and help take care of our neighbors. Thank you very much. Councilmember Freeman. I, I apologize. Um, it's all right. I, I'm just pulling myself together. I just want to also add to the conversation in that when I'm talking about the enslavement of our immigrant community, is it's the fact that there is not a deportation happening, is that there being there there are immigrants who are being held and forced to work at these detention centers, and it's not acceptable for us to continue to put them there. It has to stop. I also want to add that the Spanish-speaking community is under severe attack, but so is the African community and the Muslim community immigrants as well and is not limited to one group. This is all of us, and we have to stand for one another. Thank you very much. Thank you all for indulging us on an item that wasn't on our agenda, but is important to our community. And now we'll move on to uh, the next announcement, next announcement by the council, uh, which has to do with the Statement by the Durham City Council on International Police Exchanges. Um, the council will be voting on this this evening. 
whether or not to approve this statement. Uh, I read the statement, and it was discussed by council members at our work session 10 days ago. After a lengthy process of discussion and hearing from our community, and since that time, we've heard from many more of you. Thank you. We enjoy hearing from you. Um, and I, we have many people who've signed up, almost 50 people, so to speak. So uh, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to read the statement again. Uh, it's not too very long. Uh, at that point, uh, I will uh, ask any council member that has a comment at that point to comment, but then we will have comments from the public. And then I will ask my council colleagues again to discuss it. Uh, I think that's probably when most of our discussion will take place as a council. Since we have 50 people uh, who have signed up to speak, I'm going to give everyone two minutes. If you had planned on three minutes, which is what we mostly give uh, when we have 10 speakers or something, uh, please rearrange your comments into two minutes. We are strict. There's a timer right over here that the city clerk will be operating. You will be standing over at this podium, and when the two minutes are done, the two minutes are seriously done. Okay. Um, I'm now going to read the statement. Statement by the Durham City Council on International Police Exchanges. The Durham City Council appreciates receipt of the memo dated April 4th, 2018 from Chief C.J. Davis to City Manager Tom Bonfield stating that, quote, there has been no effort while I have served as Chief of Police to initiate or participate in any exchange to Israel, nor do I have any intention to do so. The Durham City Council endorses this statement by Chief Davis and affirms this policy that the Durham Police Department will not engage in such exchanges. The Council opposes international exchanges with any country in which Durham officers receive military-style training since such exchanges do not support the kind of policing we want here in the city of Durham. We recognize and share the deep concern about militarization of police forces around the country. We know that racial profiling and its subsequent harms to communities of color have plagued policing in our nation and in our own community. In Durham, our community is working towards a time when we are beyond policing, when everyone has a good job and excellent health care and a safe, warm, affordable place to live. Until that time comes, we want policing that is founded on earning the trust of the community. We want policing that effectively reduces gun violence without any racial profiling ever. We want policing and a justice system that do not criminalize small acts such as drug possession. We are moving in that direction in Durham under the strong, persistent leadership of Chief Davis and her staff. The police department is undergoing a profound cultural shift, which is evident in the numbers in the annual reports we have just received for 2017. The reporting shows that while violent crime is on a 17-year downward trend in Durham, we are also undergoing an extremely dramatic shift in the way Durham is engaging in police work. Traffic stops in recent years have dropped from 32,227 to 11,578. Searches of cars have dropped from 1,296 in 2013 to 416 in 2017. Charges for drug violations in Durham are down from 1,223 in 2015 to 673 this past year. Our new misdemeanor diversion court has kept hundreds of first-time offenders free of a criminal record. Use of force complaints by residents are down from 33 in 2016 to 15 last year. Chief Davis' new U visa policy has resulted in immediate improvement for our undocumented residents who assist in solving crimes, as 35 residents received U visa approval from the department in the first quarter of 2018, far more than ever before. An array of new police department policies and practices are working in Durham. And as the numbers above show with striking clarity, these reforms are today making a positive difference in lives of thousands of people especially in communities of color. The council knows that we still have much progress to make. Although police searches have dropped precipitously among all groups, black motorists are still more likely to be searched than white motorists, and we need to continue efforts to ensure 
that the racial makeup of our police department more nearly represents Durham's diversity. The council is deeply committed to this work and we are grateful to Chief Davis for leading this cultural shift. Black lives matter. We can make that phrase real in Durham by rejecting the militarization of our police force in favor of a different kind of policing and that is where, what we are doing in Durham now. So that's the statement and I'm gonna ask now if I, any brief comments by my council colleagues after which we will hear from, we will hear from members of the public. Council members? All righty, thank you. We're now going to hear from members of the public. Uh, this is not a public hearing. It's not a public hearing format. It's not going to. Um, it's not going to be everybody for and everybody against. At, at different times in the program, I'm going to call your name. When I call your name, I would like you to please come over here to the podium and uh, await your turn. And I will begin by calling uh, Jane Wagstaff, Muhammad Eid. Larry Beckler, Richard Ford, K. Robert Volkwine, and Tanad Shawa. If you all could please all come over here in the order I called you, uh, that would be great. So, Jane Wagstaff, you're our first speaker. Is Jane Wagstaff here? Jane Wagstaff, are you in the room? Please come up. You're our first speaker. Ms. Wagstaff will be followed by Muhammad Eid, Larry Beckler, Richard Ford, K. Robert Volkwine, uh, Volkwine, I'm not sure if I got that right, and Tanaj Shawa. So all of you all who have called your name, you need to be up here now. If you're not up here now, you won't be speaking, okay? Ms. Wagstaff? You Hello. Please, please, just for all speakers, please give us your name and address, and you have two minutes. Ms. Wagstaff, welcome. My name is Jane Wagstaff. I live in uh, Pennington Place in Durham, and I'm just going to be very brief. I think the city is safer if we adopt best practices. There are lots of studies, I'm sure, on best practices, no matter where they come from. And we're all safer if the police are part of the community. And Durham's about to price the police out of this community. It is hard to live in this community on a policeman's salary. So if you want community policing, then you need to be able to have police who actually live here. So I think that's a very important piece of this. But we're all safer if we're looking at best practices and we're always open to best practices wherever it comes from and do the job that they're hired to do and insist on the best quality and training for the people that they hire. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Wagstaff. We'll now hear from Mohammed Eid. Mr. Eid, please state your name and address, and you have two minutes. Thank you. My name is Muhammad Eid. I live in <coughs> Carbrook Collins Crossing, 501 Jones Ferry Road. Originally, I'm from Gaza Strip, Palestine. I came here last August. Since I came here, I haven't met but friendly, kind, and generous people, people I care for. I've been in a peaceful community. I came here today to give my testimony for I care for this community. I won't bother you with all the stories about the IDF storming my village since I was 12 years old, when I had to wake up at night at the sound of dogs barking inside my house, at the scene of my father being beaten down to the ground, at the scene of my mother and my siblings being pushed around and shouted at. <clears throat> I won't tell you, sorry, I won't tell you about the humiliati humiliating interrogation I had to go through on the checkpoints on my way out of Gaza Strip. I'll just ask you to search on YouTube Gaza Mars, who've returned, married with a flag, and see my neighbor, a 14-year-old, a 14-young girl called Mary, being shot in her leg, and watch the people carry her away, and watch her leg, leg swinging around as the bone is literally being crushed by the bullet. <coughs> Sorry. 
Watch carefully, because you must know well what practices will be brought back home. Such soldiers laugh when Israel sniper kills innocent elderly Palestinian. And watch the ethics your men will be learning overseas. Watch and think of your own mothers and grandmothers. Search sniper shooting Palestinian on Gaza border. And watch how the officer commands the soldier to aim at the boy, a very young boy, shooting him, and they both cheer in excitement. Watch and watch and think of what you will be bringing back to the place you call home. Because once your home is ruined, you will never enjoy life anywhere else. For that reason, I support the policy statement against Israel police exchanges, and I support the demilitarized Durant to Palestine campaign. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excuse me. I know you're going to want to applaud. There are 50 speakers, okay? At the very end, you kind of can applaud as much as you want, but I'm going to ask you all, all to please hold your applause so we can get through this and everybody gets the respect that they deserve, okay? So please hold your applause. Thank you so much. Um, Larry Beckler. Yes, Larry Beckler, Durham, uh, Lakers Court in Durham. I'm a little confused by all the issues. I first became aware of the general topic last Thursday. Uh, I think at minimum this can be considered a very liquid or fluid rather situation. I've been around now for about 70 years and I was nine when Nikita Khrushchev said we'll bury you from within. That was in November of 56. I think Russia has done a very good job of trying to keep its word. In a recent vote over half of the millennials said they thought socialism is a good idea. Never mind that it's never worked anywhere it's been tried. I draw this correlation between communism, the US, and Israel because the communists have always had a real problem with God and Jews in particular. I'd like to discuss racism for Israel, as was stated in a, a comment. I'd like to point out that in 84 was Operation Moses, and in 1991, Operation Solomon, and that's when Israel went into Ethiopia and rescued black Jews who refused to give up their faith and brought them to live in their homeland. They're called the Beta Israel Community, and the largest Beta community in the world. Terrorist, I have to comment that the ruling body in Israel is the Knesset. It's made up of Jews, Gentiles, women, and Muslims. And what I was interested to find out is that the percentage of Muslims on the Knesset is actually more than the percentage of Muslims in the, in the country. I'm gonna skip to the end. I would like to respectfully suggest the, a word of caution for the council. The Bible says those who bless Israel will be blessed, and those who curse Israel will be cursed. If you curse Israel today or in the future, I believe you'll bring woe upon Durham, North Carolina, and the U.S. Jerusalem is the king of, kingdom of God. Baruch shem kavod malchuso le'olam vo'ed. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, king of the universe, forever. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Beckler. Richard Ford. Richard Ford, 6416 Falcon Bridge uh, Road, Durham. Uh, I am the uh, chair of the Friends of Durham. The Friends of Durham do not have a position on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. However, we wonder why the City Council feeds, needs, <clears throat> feels the need to take up a position on this. There are real problems facing this city, and the Palestinian situation is not one of them. And further, nobody has ever suggested sending Durham policemen to Israel for training. Just look at the letter you published from Chief Davis. So this entire discussion is much ado about nothing, in my opinion, and it is pursuing an insult to our chief and the police force. It is ignoring the advice of rabbis representing the arc of Jewish faith in Durham. If the council is going to work on this issue, and not Durham issues, such as public safety, affordable housing, homelessness, transportation, etc., then one wonders, what is the council's job? If the proponents tout that Durham will be the first city to adopt such a resolution, you know why no other city council has done so, because it has nothing to do with the city council. This council will end up helping the activist group say, oh, a city, a public body has supported them. 
That's what happened when I was on the Human Relations Commission with reports on the police and the jail. Before this meeting over, the proponents will have a press release out on this. Is this what we are doing with our city council? Please do not take this action. Table the resolution. We'll speak at any meeting you want. But don't pretend that this is city council business or that you speak for the city on this matter. The Friends of Durham concentrate on Durham elections and issues. I hope that the city council will as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ford. Uh, now, uh, K. Robert Volkwein, and while you're coming forth, Mr. Volkwein, I'm gonna call the next speakers. I would like to ask you to line up behind them as well. Sandra Korn, Gabriel Liberty, Jasmine Williams, Jack Stanley, Ralph McCoy, and Jonathan Diane. If you all could come and stand over here as well, that would be great. Mr. Volkwein. My name is Kay Robert Volkwein, and I live at 605 Sanderson Drive in Durham, North Carolina. Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council, thank you for this opportunity to address you on this important issue. Let me start off with a quote from Nelson Mandela. We must use time wisely and forever realize that time is always right to do right. To make this policy that Durham will not send officers to Israel to be trained, to make it into law is indeed something that is the right thing to do. Too many times in Durham and elsewhere in this country, Police have caused pain and sadness, especially if they've been trained by the IDF. For as we can see in the last few weeks, the way in which the IDF has handled peaceful protests is not the way we want our peace officers to act. Let the city council do right so that they can be on the right side of history. Nelson Mandela, again, it always seems impossible until it is done. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Thank you, Mr. Volkwein. And now I believe that we, uh, now I believe we have Jihad Shawa. Mr. Shawa? Yes, right. sir. Uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you so much. I'm trying to get here a video that it's been feeding, but I can't find Vivian. She said it's here. It's a, it's a must that I show you one minute out of it. My name is Jihad Shawa again, and last time I was here yes. uh, on the, uh, L, uh, on the uh, you know, former mayor, uh, I changed the name of the city to city of Medis, I mean city of justice. I hope it's gonna stay that way, city of justice, when you were talking about the equality for Muslims. Now it's the time to talk about equality of human being. Thank you so much. Uh, last time Sheila was hugged, and this time I ask you to hug four of your administrations, uh, Ms. Amos and uh, uh, Ms. Brooks, uh, Diana, uh, Karmish, and Vivian. They are wonderful. So do hug them for me. I will. I'll show you that. Thank you. Gentlemen right here, I don't know if you can. What do I need to do? Click it? Vivian, mm -hmm. help. <laughs> Time is running out. <laughs> well, anyway, this guy here, you can even, yes, you can see him. Uh, how do I turn that on? I want him to talk. Try yeah, push the, push play. the triangle. Uh, Anybody can help? Excuse me. It's okay from the audience. You really don't need. Well, to I gotta that. say, yeah, go ahead. This, this is, this is a, a not, well, not Nazi. I'm sorry. That's a Zionism. And then you've got the Israeli army, which I like to refer to as one of the most, one of the best trained, best equipped, best fed terrorist organizations in the world. That's the idea. And yes, they have generals and they have nice uniforms, but their entire, their entire uh, purpose is terrorism. So that's and just as one example, I'll give you one example. Almost exactly four years ago, as Israel okay. began its attack. This is Israel, and this is a Zionism, born as a Zionism, and then he found the lying. He found all the intimidation. He found the theft Mr. that Shawa. has been done 
Mr. Shala. No. Thank you. Your two minutes are up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Sandra Korn, followed by Gabriel Liberty. You have two minutes. Please state your name and address. Thank you. My name is Sandra Korn, and I live at 803 North Street, Durham, North Carolina. Um, for those of you who are here in support of the demilitarized Durham to Palestine um, campaign and the policy statement against Israel police exchanges, would you just please rise in, with your hands or your bodies? Thank you. So I want to speak tonight about the power of coalition work and about where the Jewish community stands on this issue. I have had the immense honor of being part of the demilitarized Durham to Palestine coalition for the past two years. Straight and queer, students and elders, white, black, Latinx and Arab, Muslim, Christian, secular and Jewish, we have come together with a shared vision for human rights and racial justice. This coalition and this city council exemplify what I love so much about Durham and why I've made this city my home. I'm a Jewish educator, a leader in my synagogue, and I'm so glad to see so many members of Durham's incredible Jewish community here tonight. My Jewish family and texts have taught me that if you can save a single life, it is as if you have saved the entire world. That's why I care so deeply about Palestinian human rights and why I mourn the protesters in Gaza who've been killed 30, over 30 since the start of Passover. That's why I believe and agree with the city council that black lives matter. These are statements of Jewish values. Um, so city councilors, um, I want you to know that you may be accused of anti-Semitism for passing the statement, I, a Jewish person, have been accused of anti-Semitism for my support for Palestinian human rights. But you should know that these accusations are just meant to threaten you away from sticking to your own values. The Durham community of all faiths rises behind you and we will support you in making a statement that represents our city's progressive values. I support the policy statement against Israel police exchanges and I support the demilitarized Durham to Palestine campaign. Thank you. Hold your applause, please. Gabriel Liberty. Mr. Liberty, welcome. You have two minutes. Hello, my name is... Uh, Hello, my name is Gabriel Liberty. I live on Hennington Way in Durham, North Carolina in Carolyn Forest. Um, based on my parents, you probably don't know this, but I'm actually an Israeli-American. I have four children who are also Israeli. And um, needless to say, I'm, I'm, I'm torn by this statement as I agree with the second part of it, but the fact that Israel is mentioned in this doc, in, in your statement, makes it into an issue that I, I actually am against because it's a hard one for me because Israel, in my respect, is the most moral, most esteemed country in this world who has provided so much to this world that most people don't even understand through whether it's the technology in their cell phone to their laptops that they use every day or the, the health benefits that they receive through the medicines and the water that the world receives and the food that is used in order to grow food for the poor and the impoverished, and they've given so much through this because it is a Jewish tenant that we give back to this world. We make this world a better place than what we live in today. And what this statement does is it ostracizes us. It ostracizes us, it demeans us in a way that says you're different than the rest of the countries because you don't mention any other country who does terrible acts of violence on their own citizens, like what just happened in Syria. What you're doing is you're basically, you're putting emphasis on a country that tries so hard to do so good. And then there's so much hate. And because it is the only Jewish country in this world that it is ostracized and separated from the rest of the world, whether it's through the UN or, or bodies like this that always does this to us, that we feel that we don't have a place to be. And we still continue will give and we will continue to give until we can't anymore. And hopefully that day will never come and my children will be able to live a free life and to be able to be who they want to be without the threat of being killed for simply who, being who they are and from the mother that they were born to. Thank you, Mr. Liberty. Jasmine Williams. Ms. Williams, you have two minutes. Please give us your name and address. Thank you. My name is Jasmine Williams. Um, I live at 802 Underwood Avenue. Um, I think a lot of people here probably understand why we don't want our police taking pointers from the Israeli military, um, but we also have to remember they shouldn't be taking tips from us either. 
um, policing in this country is so violent and so historically racist that it shocks other countries. Um, and black people make up triple the proportion of the population on the inside than they do in the country as a whole. Um, and I say this as a black person, um, as a person who is Muslim, um, as a person who is indigenous to this land that we not now call the United States. Um, so when we, we're looking at a country that's in a state which a lot of people would describe as apartheid, I think the last place that they should look to to swap expertise with would be the people running the United States incarceration system. I support the ban exchange changes, both um, for the sake of over-policed people here, especially black and brown people, um, and in Palestine. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Jake Stanley. Mr. Stanley, you have two minutes. Hi there, I'm Jake Stanley. I live at uh, 200 Knox Circle in Durham. And I'm here uh, as a millennial representing the North Carolina Piedmont chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America, a uh, sponsoring partner of this campaign. Um, so as a democratic socialist, we believe in government, government truly by, for, and of the people. We are fighting alongside the groups today and many all over the country to transform the United States so that everyone, particularly black, indigenous, immigrant, LGBTQ, Muslim, and other oppressed communities can thrive not merely survive on the scraps of a wildly unequal capitalist system. Freedom from the fear of state violence is essential to creating that thriving society. But as we have seen in the past decade in the streets of Ferguson, Chicago, and Baltimore, the sidewalks of Staten Island, the neighborhoods of Sa South Sacramento, and countless places in between, including just over the weekend with ICE, um, black and brown people are disproportionately threatened and killed by law enforcement. The militarization of police, municipal and county forces that look more and more like an army than peace officers, this compounds a systemic problem. We reject the idea that US police, from the leadership down to regular officers, have anything to learn from the Israeli military police, the enforcement arm of a racist apartheid state and a violent settler colonial project. We are encouraged by Durham's efforts to reform the police towards support of and accountability <laughs> to Durhamites, especially our communities of color, although we agree with Mayor Shul and the council that there is much more work to do. We want to focus on improving other me measures of public safety, like affordable housing and health care, strong public education, and a livable wage. Therefore, we join this call for the Durham City Council to create a new policy that unconditionally bars police training exchanges with Israel or other foreign militaries and police. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Ralph McCoy. Mr. McCoy, you have two minutes. Thank you. Ralph McCoy, 4305 Myers Park Drive, Durham. I keep on my cell phone a picture of a 13-year-old boy, Ahmad Abu Dhaka. On November the 9th, 2012, I was with an interfaith delegation in Gaza when we received a call from a UN representative asking us to come to a local village. There we met Ahmad's parents. The previous day, Ahmed was playing soccer with friends in front of his home. He was shot by an IDF soldier from an Israeli hel helicopter. The Israeli military was in Gaza illegally clearing terrain beside the wall that imprisons that land. Ahmed ran to his front door and fell dead. Since his death, over 700 children have been killed by Israeli police and military, most from indiscriminate fire. It's impossible to express the grief of his parents that day. Only, Sig, only Cindy and Craig Corey, our leaders on that delegation, could understand their unspeakable loss. Their daughter, Rachel, was run over and killed by an Israeli military bulldozer while protesting the demolition of a, of a Palestinian home in 2003. There was never any public investigation or explanation of why the IDF soldier shot Ahmed. During the past three weeks, men, women, and children in Gaza have been protesting a 50-year occupation and illegal imprisonment. They have been shot by Israeli military snipers. Is this the type of culture that we want the Durham police to have training in. I support the 
policy against Israel, police and military exchange. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCoy. Uh, before the next speaker comes forward, I'm going to ask to line up also um, Dr. Burhan Ghanayim, William Rosenberg, Faisal Khan, I hope I have that name right, Laura Gutman, and I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time reading this one, Laura Partash, perhaps, and Max Cherman. If you all could please line up behind Mr. Diane in order, that would be great. Mr. Diane, thank you for being here. You have two minutes. Thank you, council members. Thank you, council members. Uh, Jonathan Diane, I live on Anderson Street in Duke Forest in Durham. Uh, we moved here seven years ago to be transient, and we loved Durham so much that we decided to stay in this wonderful city built a, a new uh, business here. And ironically, our business is mainly uh, bringing money from Israel for uh, lower income investments, uh, uh, building housing for lower income in uh, Durham. So uh, I hope that in the end of this evening, we will find a reason for more investments coming to Durham, that we are more inclusive. The, the beautiful part about this council is everything that was said in the beginning. So all the proclamations, our wonderful achievements in, in, in Central University. All of this is all inclusive, is all what we love about Durham. And then comes a statement uh, that 95% of it is great, but it starts with some kind of racist, dividing uh, line. And it says Israel, it doesn't say Syria, it doesn't say South American countries that are oppressive. And the, the ironic part of it is that no one here that spoke up to now said a word about policing. We all talked about military. Now, if the, if the statement's idea is to bring up the problems between Palestine and Israel, it did a wonderful job. If the statement idea is to keep Durham unified with the great police that has a future and keeps its citizens safe, then leave out Israel. Just talk about what the, what the, the issues are. And don't bring up this divide. Look, at, we're half-half. Yes, some people uh, uh, clap a little bit more or less, clap a little less, but we all love each other in the end if we love Durham, okay? Let's put aside Israel and Palestine, make a, make a statement again with, for the police, build Durham, leave, leave the politics for others to deal with right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diane. <laughs> Dr. Burhan Ghanayim. You have two minutes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure my family on occupied Palestine dream of having this right that we all are enjoying tonight. My name is Burhan Ghanayim. I am Durham a resident for uh, more than 35 years. I stand here today in support of the policy statement to be considered by the city council. Just in the last two weeks in the Palestinian territory of Gaza, we have witnessed this deadly force by the Israeli army that is used against Palestinian protesters. Over 35 people were killed, over 1,000 people were injured. Their fault was demanding freedom and return of the stolen land and homes that they lost. This is not new. I was the uh, victim of brutal beating as a teenager in my high school in occupied Palestine when the Israeli army stormed our high school, came into our classes and beat us with now mercy or uh, reason. All the reason we were protesting the presence of soldiers on our high school grounds. That was our fault. The Israeli military tactics, this is the tactics that they are trying to sell to the city of Durham and other cities in the United States, how to suppress crowds, how curtail freedoms. Israel markets these tactics as tested and tried on Palestinians. We wholeheartedly endorse the proposed statement. I like to assure all of my Durham uh, fellow uh, uh, neighbors, that this coalition today is not anti-Semitic. It is 
against anti-Semitism. It is against racism. It's against <clears throat> uh, brutalities against minorities, people of color. I extend my hand to all of you who oppose this to come and join me in support of this statement. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ghanayim. Dr. Ghanayim. Uh, William Rosenberg, please come forward. You have two minutes, and please uh, state your name and address. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. My name is William Rosenberg. I'm a resident of RTP in Cary, but I have a strong interest in what's happening here. Um, my request is that you table this statement at this time until you can measure and understand the full impact of what it means to Durham. Please understand that if the Durham City Council passes this statement outside of the Durham City Council, it will be widely recognized and widely publicized as anti-Israeli and anti-Semitic. That will adversely affect the broad interests of Durham in business, home values, schools, and universities. So I request one thing, that you table this until you actually measure and understand the long-term impacts that this action could have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosenberg. We'll now hear from Faisal Khan. You have two minutes. Please give us your name and address. Faisal Khan, uh, 501 Jones Ferry Road, Carborough. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor, Council members, and everybody else in the audience for giving me the opportunity to speak on this very important issue. <clears throat> I want to ask all the council members, including the mayor, to ask this question to yourself, your conscience. Would you support what ICE did this, this past weekend? Because they are doing exactly the same thing as what the Israeli police and IDF are doing in occupied territories of Palestine. I want you to ask this question to yourself. How would a two-year-old child would ask for help when his or her house is invaded by the intelligence community of Israel or IDF or the Israeli police? How would that child would ask for help? How did this child ask for help when the ICE agent stormed into that apartment? Or in Carborough? or in Chicago, or in LA, because we are dealing with the same issue here. This is not a political issue. This is a human rights issue. This is the dignity of Palestinians living in Gaza, which is a part of Palestine, living in the West Bank, which is part of Palestine, East Jerusalem, which is part of Palestine. Very simple. I'm really disturbed what is happening in this country right now. Unprecedented and unacceptable. We should not have any training exchange programs with the Durham Police Department or any Israeli intelligence police or IDF. It's unacceptable. So I ask you, support this statement. Thank you. Thank you. Can I hold you, ask you to hold your applause, please? Laura Gutman, please come forward. You have two minutes. Members of the council um, audience, um, I'm Laura Gutman, and I live on Watts Avenue. I've been there for 47 years. Um, I um, wanted to uh, comment on the um, proposal, which appears to be a proposal having to do with the training of the um, uh, Durham County, uh, the Durham City Law and, uh, for Enforcement Agents. Um, we have a very fine chief of police who was recruited uh, very carefully. She comes with an enormously credible uh, reputation nationally. Um, uh, she's a very fine, uh, exceptional <clears throat> uh, recruit. Part of the uh, usual uh, uh, um, uh, expectations of the chief of police is that she will determine the appropriate training for the police officers. And um, this um, uh, statement is going to compromise that um, and uh, removes that from her 
uh, full purview. Uh, I think this is profoundly disrespectful for a highly professional um, uh, member of, of our community who was brought to us, um, uh, I think by perhaps members of this uh, council. Um, in any case, I think that, again, that this is very disrespectful, and I urge you to um, return this, um, uh, the, the ability of, of, uh, of her ability to train, to decision, the, the, the decisions to train her own officers um, uh, for the appropriate roles which they have to play. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Gutman. Now we'll hear from Laura Hantash. Not sure I have that right. Um, hi, my name is Lama Abu Hantash, and I live at Duke University. Um, okay. There's, since 1967, 40% of Palestinian men and 20% of Palestinian women have been in prison at some point in their lives. In, so, in some ways, the ones who make it to prison with their limbs and lives intact are the lucky ones. These IDF soldiers incarcerate, mutilate, and often kill young Palestinian men to prevent them from fighting back against apartheid. In fact, of my mother's 24 male cousins in the West Bank, 23 have been arrested on trumped up charges, virtually all were beaten, and many were brutally tortured in Israeli prisons against the Geneva Convention. This institutionalized system of prejudice and mass incarceration is mirrored here in the US, which boasts the world's largest prison population and is disproportionately composed of black men. In the words of Angela Davis, Palestinians and black Americans are in the same state, the carceral state, which is alive and growing here in Durham. The Durham police are supposed to serve and protect our community, but IDF soldiers neither serve nor protect Palestine, they occupy it. By engaging in police exchanges, Durham's department is learning to enhance racial profiling, use excessive force, and police the community like an occupying military. Just yesterday, I had probably the scariest experience of my life not involving an IDF machine gun when I woke up to a text from my friend saying he'd been arrested. While walking on Duke Central Campus the night before, a police officer had stopped him and asked for his identification, but he wasn't carrying his Duke ID. He was later handcuffed and held in police custody until his roommate confirmed that he is in fact a Duke student. But why hadn't he a vi visibly college-aged a person on a busy campus been singled out as if he didn't belong because he's a young black man. These are your tax dollars at work, racial profiling and presumption of guilt courtesy of the IDF. The Durham Police Department must reflect the community it serves, not the Israeli military. We must end police exchanges. I support the, uh, this resolution um, to end Israeli pr police exchanges with Durham. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, Max Chairman, you have two minutes. As Mr. Chairman comes up, I'm going to call out the names of the next group of speakers. And if you'll come over here to my right and line up, that would be great. Uh, and Jenny Blass, David Roswell, Jerome Fox, Carol Fox, David, T-H-E-U-R-E, -E, baby, Thurer, not sure. You live on Demaria Street. You know who you are. Uh, Rabbi Zalman Blooming and Lee Mortimer. If you all could please come over here to my right uh, and you will be following Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, thank you for being here. Please tell us your name and address. Hi, I'm Max Chairman. I'm also a student at Duke. Today we are faced with a non-issue. Non, no ongoing Durham police cooperation with any military exists, nor would it be likely. Chief Davis asserted her one visit to Israel was a goodwill trip focused solely on leadership development and public relations with homeless populations. She should not be misrepresented by this council. Despite a letter signed by 10 esteemed diverse local rabbis warning against targeting Israel, certain members of this council joined the joined petitioners and put political interests ahead of the community they serve. Is this consistent with a Durham for all? Will these members have the professionalism to become proximate with the, Jewish, with the concerned Jewish community? Or will they continue their sly machinations while fleeing from accountability to their constituents? Note this, Students for Justice in Palestine at Duke University, a group closely tied with the petitioners, ignores the terrorist group Hamas's genocidal ambitions and suggests Israel provokes wars in Gaza to use it as a human laboratory 
of experimentation subjects for testing its advanced weapons in intelligence systems for economic gain. It's 2018, and the Jews are again being baselessly and shamelessly accused of heartless manipulation, murder, etc., for economic gain. This must be stopped. However, it seems like the council today is intent on sending its message. The message it sends is a resounding one. If you are a business owner or an individual looking for a community to call home, don't you seek a community built on respect, honesty, and trust, not one that stabs you in the back? Shouldn't your elected leaders care about serving their hardworking constituents, not narrow political interests? Today, the Jewish community has been misled and ignored. Tomorrow, it could be you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll now hear from Jenny Blass. Ms. Blass, please tell us your name and address. You have two minutes. I'm Jenny Blass, Odie's Road, Chapel Hill. Um, not, not Durham, but I know a lot, but I go to a shul in the area, and I know a lot of people who live here. Um, anyway, um, I'm Jewish and proud of my religion and heritage, and that extends to the state of, um, and that extends to the state of Israel. The insinuations that the state of Israel, with um, where I have family, is racist and supports white supremacy are extremely harmful to me. I feel that what Israel does has been misconstrued by many people in this room. Israel only fights in self-defense and the Israelis want peace as much as the Palestinians. The labeling of Israel in particular is violent um, and militant, is offensive to me as a person, and as hints of anti-Semitism. I'm not saying that this issue isn't worth discussing, I just think we, um, that we need to take a look at the motivations, in particular political ones, that are behind this controversy. I hope Durham and the research triangle as a whole will continue to be welcoming to people who identify with Israel like I do. Thank you for giving me your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Blass. Now we'll hear from David Roswell. You have two minutes. Hi, I'm David Roswell. I live at 106 West Woodridge Drive in Durham. I'm a member of the People's Alliance and am reading a statement written by the People's Alliance in support of the campaign. Dear Mayor Shul and members of the Durham City Council, we are writing to express the support of the Durham's People's Alliance with a campaign led by the Durham to Palestine Coalition to preclude, to preclude any collaboration between the Durham Police Department and the Israeli Defense Force. We strongly support the message in Mayor Shul's statement that the council opposes international exchanges with any country in which Durham officers receive military style training since such exchanges do not support the kind of policing we want here in the city of Durham. We ask that the city council to act on that message and to pass a resolution that clearly expresses the city's commitment to pursue community safety without resort to the kind of military tactics used by the Israeli police against Palestinians. Policing in the US has a long history of violence against black and brown communities. While the Durham Police Department under Chief C.J. Davis has begun to make progress in reducing the incidence, the incidence of targeting and violence against black and brown communities, including immigrant communities, we want to see continued progress and more demilitarization, not less. The demilitarized Durham to Palestine, Palestine campaign is based on the finding that police exchanges between the US and Israel pr promote militarized policing at home and overseas. And we have seen under the Trump administration the language of security and counterterrorism being used to enable racist scapegoating and justify violent and discriminatory practices against targeted communities. Now, more than ever, we need to challenge the idea that our security comes from militaries, police, prisons, and border walls, and work towards a safer world for all people based on community, equality, and justice. The People's Alliance believes that Durham can best promote public safety by moving ahead on the vision laid out by the mayor in his State of the City address. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Jerome Fox. Uh, my name is Jerome Fox. I live on 13 Mandy Court here in Durham. I'm one of the rabbis who uh, sent the letter to the council urging you not to uh, single out the state of Israel in your condemnation or your, your um, problems you're having with police training. 
And uh, I've had a lot to say, but I'm going to have to cut it, I know. I want to say that the group that is fomenting that is called the Jewish Voice for Peace. And that sounds very nice. But one of them came to a seminar I was teaching just Thursday of last week, and she began to spout um, what I would call anti-Semitism. She said the Israeli army is uh, a bunch of butchers just as bad as ISIS. Uh, that's why I'm wearing the er Israeli army skull cap tonight, by the way. Uh, and then she went on to say that she wants one state between the Jordan and the Mediterranean. And I said, well, then, you know, the Jews would eventually get outnumbered. And then the Palestinians there could democratically de-Judaize the state of Israel and throw out the national anthem, the Hebrew language, et cetera, et cetera. And I contend that any person who ha says that, who wants to de-Judaize the state of Israel, is an anti-Semite. And this particular young woman who came to my class, I believe, is a Jew. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, K Carol Fox. Carol Fox, you have two minutes. Thank you for being here. OK, you're welcome. So my name is Carol Fox, and I live at 13 Mandy Court in Durham. And I would like to request of city council that you please remove mention of Israel or the Israeli police from your resolution uh, on other matters concerning the city of Durham. Israel has no relevance to the issue of how Durham police does its job. Israel has no relevance to the issue of police brutality or unfair treatment of people of color or disabled people here in Durham or in the United States. Removing mention of Israel will make the proposed resolution stronger and clearer and less confusing. Removing mention of Israel from the resolution will prevent city council from muddying the waters in the issue of community policing and local city matters. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and now we will hear from David Thurer. Hi, y'all. Um, I'm David Thurer. I live on Demarius Street here in Durham. And I'm here representing the Inside Outside Alliance to support the ban on police exchanges with Israel. We believe that the displacement of Palestinian people is unjust and that it's important to disrupt the facade of normalcy such exchanges seek to create the occupation of Palestine. Having seen in the past few weeks the violence carried out against Palestinian protesters by Israeli security forces, we believe such exchanges would only further militarize the Durham police. I can say personally, having been tear gassed by the Durham police while peacefully protesting the death in custody of uh, Chui Huerta, that we are already, that they are already dangerously militarized. Because of this, we support the policy statement against Israeli police exchanges and we support the demilitarized uh, Durham to Palestine campaign. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Rabbi Zalman Blooming. Thank you, Your Honor, the Mayor and the City Council. I have the greatest respect for you and our community and Jewish community prays for your success and continued success each week in Shul. First of all, I want to thank you for bringing so many people together to speak about Israel right before her 70th birthday. I congratulate you on the 150th birthday of Durham, North Carolina, which we're going to be in it one year from now, and over 3,000 years of the Jewish presence in the holy eternal capital in the city of Jerusalem. But I have one request. My request is let's make the city we love a city for all. I'm here less to talk about Israel and more to talk about Durham. As a rabbi that works with a lot of young adults and students here in this community, my phone has been ringing nonstop over the last week of young adults that live here that feel unsafe, that feel marginalized, that feel, uh, feel as if for some reason they've been singled out. And I'm not firing any judgments on the city council on what they meant, but language matters and it affects. 
And I wonder why, if a statement was made, why don't we consider this sensitively? If there are many rabbis in our community. Was any of our rabbis spoken to? Uh, were the heads of the Jewish Federation spoken to? So we can share the sensitivities about this very vital and very important issue. Look, I've been to Israel. I'd like to argue probably more than almost anyone in this room. I sat there a few months ago, a few weeks ago, by the Gaza border. So I know what it is, huddling with young 18-year-old people who are fighting for their lives in this desperate battle. It's very, it is not simple at all. And I'm wondering why would you single out Israel? You want to mention all countries in the world that you don't want to work with? Good luck. You feel free to. Israel doesn't need business. Israel is doing very well. But why? <laughs> Why is Israel mentioned and singled out? And so my only prayer to the city council, which does such incredible work, is let's make the city we love a city for all. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Now we'll hear from, now we'll hear from Lee Mortimer. And while Mr. Mortimer is coming up, I'm going to ask um, these people to also come up. Uh, and to my right, Evelina Mulder. Tom Stern, Deborah Friedman, Elise Crystal, Mushka Blooming, and Ehab Mikati. And I believe that there's another Deborah Friedman. We have two of you. No, you're the same person. <laughs> but you may not speak twice. Okay. Um, all right, uh, so now we're going to hear from Mr. Mortimer, followed by Ms. Mulder. Mr. Mortimer, welcome. You have two minutes. Good evening. I'm Lee Mortimer. I live at 4116 Livingstone Place in the Trotter Ridge neighborhood. I'm a 30-year resident of Durham. Our son entered kindergarten here and went through Durham Public Schools. I participated in a number of civic activities, including serving on two task forces studying city-county merger. I was a youth soccer coach several seasons and a candidate for the school board in the year 2000. I think I did better as a soccer coach than in that school board election. I'm here tonight representing the Coalition for Peace with Justice. Our office is located at the Lion Park Community Center. We advocate for a peaceful resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We have endorsed, and I have personally participated in, the demilitarized Durham to Palestine campaign. We urge you to support this policy statement, putting the city of Durham on record as opposing members of our police department being trained by Israel's police and military. I don't know all the components of training that other U.S. police departments have undergone during often fully paid trips to Israel. I do know that Israel has a well-documented record of human rights violations and that our police would gain nothing worthwhile from being trained by a regime that holds a subject people under military occupation as it dispossesses them and colonizes their land. This is not, as some opponents claim, singling out only one country on the planet, Israel. Far too many regimes brutalize their subject population. But Israel is the only one on which the U.S. government lavishes military, financial, and political support Hold your applause, please. I'm, excuse me a second. Lee, Lee, excuse me one second. I'm serious about holding the applause. Okay, Lee. And turns a blind eye to virtually every brutality it commits. Our police officers should not be trained in military-style surveillance of social movements, racial profiling, extreme crowd control measures, and use of excessive force that can lead to de facto shoot-to-kill policy. Thank you, Our Mr. Community Mortimer. Thank you. Your two minutes are up. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll now hear from Evelina Mulder. I'm Evelina Mulder. I live on Settlement Drive in Durham. I must admit I'm perplexed. The statement on policing by the city council seems to be a response to a non-existent problem. Police Chief Davis has indicated that there are no plans to train with police from other countries. So why is it necessary to issue a statement that there will be no training with Israel? I fear that the council, by issuing this statement, has become a pawn 
in a publicity initiative. I moved to Durham in part because it's a well-managed city with elected and appointed officials who share the values that I hold dear. This statement, as currently worded, demonizes Israel and by implication the Jewish people. I am one of those Jewish people and I'm a Durham resident. I have no vested interest in whether the Durham police train with the Israeli police, but I care deeply that Israel not be vilified and misrepresented. I care deeply that the council take the time to reword the statement, removing reference to Israel and thereby removing the unnecessary and politically motivated targeting and demonization of Israel. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mulder. Uh, Tom Stern, you have two minutes. <clears throat> I am Tom Stern at 204 Rigsby Avenue. I have lived in Durham for over 30 years, and I am Jewish. I speak in opposition to those who seek to sabotage the council's courageous stand against further militarization of our police by quoting from the so-called omitted portion of Chief Davis's memo regarding her experience in Israel. Their position would have you believe that these police exchanges are simply about leadership academies and building relations with refugees and the homeless. Nothing could be further from the truth. Regardless of Chief Davis's specific experience, the major organizations facilitating police exchanges with Israel tout their focus on counter-terrorism tactics. For example, I hold in my hand a recent Anti-Defamation League recruitment brochure for these police exchanges with Israel. It lists the training topics as preventing and responding to terrorist attacks, intelligence gathering, and the evolution of terrorist tactics. Two other major providers of these training state they are to strengthen law enforcement counter-terrorism practices and security tactics. There is simply no denying that these trainings are inextricably linked to the militarization of Israel's police and security forces and serve to export that mindset and those tactics to police departments in the U.S. Further, the claim that Durham was, has not been complicit in these military-style trainings is also false. Former police chief Lopez attended one in 2008, and this ADL recru recruitment brochure lists Durham, North Carolina as a police department that has participated in these military-style trainings. Think about that. The ADL is using Durham's good name, without our permission, to recruit more local police departments in the U.S. to further militarize their police departments. Durham needs to be clear that our police are community-based. We do not support racial profiling. We do not support disproportionate and violent responses to civilian protest. We do not see our own residents as the enemy. I support the City Council's proposed new policy against these exchanges. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stern. Now we're going to hear from Deborah Friedman. Ms. Friedman, welcome. You have two minutes. My name is Deborah Friedman, and I live on Hard Scrabble Drive in Hillsborough, but I am a Durham taxpayer. Members of the Council, many people in this room understand there are several different kinds of racism. <clears throat> One kind is obvious. It is in your face, use of the N-word, lynching. We have seen it all too often. Many of you also understand that there is racism that is more subtle, prison sentences that are longer for minority people, justice applied unequally, Confederate monuments. Since Jews have experienced this kind of racism called anti-Semitism for millennia, we have a long tradition of empathy and support for the African-American community's fight for equality. We are proud to have supported and provided such support. Some Jews have even sacrificed their lives for this cause. Just as there are different types of racism, there are different types of anti-Semitism. There is a swastika that even anyone in this room would recognize as an overt, obvious sign of anti-Semitism. Then there is the subtle kind that many in this room don't see. It comes in the form of a double standard of hypocrisy and scapegoating. That is exactly what is going on here. You should be ashamed to allow this to happen in Durham. It's clear that you need an explanation as to why this petition is racist, discriminatory, and anti-Semitic. It starts with the premise, a lie that is repeated so often that people believe it, that Israeli police teach militaristic tactics 
Did you bother to investigate the validity of this accusation, or is it something that you simply accept as truth without question? Israel has world-renowned expertise, not only in counterterrorism, but also in how to assist during natural disasters, and in leadership, as Police Chief Davis knows firsthand. If the concern is international training in general, why don't you investigate Argentina, Greece, Haiti, Hungary? Thank you, Ms. Friedman. Thank you. Elise Crystal, you have two minutes. Thank you. Um, my name is Elise. I live on Princeton Avenue in Durham. I'm an American Jew. Last week, Mayor Pro Tem Jillian Johnson pointed out in her statement that there's no clear evidence that the police trainings with Israel lead to increased violence on the streets of U.S. cities. Of course, violence in the U.S. predates the state of Israel, the creation of the state, a state that, like the U.S., was founded on white supremacist ideologies, on ongoing dispossession of the indigenous population, and on ongoing violence directed at its non-white population. But we do have some anecdotal evidence. For example, in Washington, D.C., police adopted the Israeli tactic picked up when they went on a ride-along with the Jer Jer Jerusalem police of keeping the red and blue lights on their cruisers flashing at all times to be more visible so that their presence is always felt, particularly in poor black neighborhoods. Rick Fuentes, superintendent of New Jersey State Police, said, the knowledge gleaned from observation and training during the trip prompted significant changes to the organizational structure of the New Jersey State Police and brought about the creation of the Homeland Security Branch. This branch, comprising nearly 1,000 members of the State Police, now maintains a steady state of vigilance in New Jersey." End quote. These strategies and policies adopted after the exchanges may appear benign, especially to those of us who are not used to being under constant surveillance. And maybe none of these police departments needed to travel to Israel to develop these plans, but they did. Is there a causal relationship be between going on these exchanges and increased violence? We may never have empirical evidence, but we see in the current political climate the kind of racist scapegoating and support for discriminatory practices against targeted communities uh, that isn't new. But now we have the opportunity to redefine safety and security on our own terms, in our own community, based on equality and justice. I support your statement. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Crystal. And now we will hear from Mushka Blooming. Ms. Blooming, you have two minutes. It's a wonderful honor to speak before you, dear mayor, and thank you for what you do for the city. It's also great to be able to talk about Israel, especially on the eve of her 70th birthday this week. As you know, North Carolina and Israel share a robust friendship built on economic cooperation and common values. For her 60th birthday, the General Assembly reaffirmed, as the resolution states, the people of Israel have established a vibrant, pluralistic, democratic political system, including a freedom of speech, press assembly, and religious and religion. Israel is also one of North Carolina's top trading partners. Since 1996, Israel has partnered with close to 2 billion services from the Tar Heel State. The two have also shared millions of billions of dollars in binational grants, supporting their respective universities as they strive to make new technological and medical advances. As a statement called for North Carolina to honor 60th anniversary as a modern state, I would love for you to do the same and continue and consider to do that for the 70th. As I'm sure you are familiar, House Bill 161, North Carolina recently signed publicly declaring support for Israel and legislating punitive measures against those boycotting the Jewish state, divestment, the companies, the boycott Israel. Yet the language of what was bought by the council highlights schismism and dividing those gives the wrong vibe about a very healthy relationship that truly exists. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Blooming. Uh, while we're waiting to hear from Ihab Makati, I'm going to call the following people up, and if you would please come over to my right, Ahmad Amira, Mike Ross, Lee Mortimer, you cannot speak again, uh, Adam Goldstein, uh, Minister Rafiq Zaidi Muhammad, Stan Raboy, Peter Reitzes, and Reverend Curtis Gatewood. If you all would please come to my right. Uh, we will now hear from 
Ihab Makati. I'm sorry, I'm working on it. Oh, sorry. Ihab Makati, sorry. If you would give us your name and address, and then you'll be followed by Ahmad Amire. Yeah, Makati, 511 Carlton Avenue. Um, I also wrote the op-ed in the Herald Sun, which I provided to Council Member Freeman. Uh, there are three comments that keep uh, coming up that people seem to be confused by that I'd like to talk about. Um, first, some people are asking, why do we care about Israel specifically? Is this a foreign policy statement? They're asking, aren't there other countries that treat people worse? And the answer is, not any countries that we give so much aid to, um, because my tax dollars fund this police department, and because my tax dollars fund a militarized Israel, it is my personal responsibility to oppose any abuses from those two institutions. It's as simple as that. Uh, the second question is, uh, is the city of Durham even taking part? Does Israel have a relationship with our PD? Um, and the answer is yes, and uh, Tom Stern earlier brought the receipts. Uh, as recently as last December, um, in, do in documents that are titled uh, National Counterterrorism Seminars. Um, and so that leads into the third question, which is, um, is there what's so wrong about counterterrorism training? Two weeks ago, the Israeli military massacred protesters near a border fence in Gaza. Uh, you may have heard that a journalist critical of the occupation was among those killed by Israeli troops. You may have seen a video that emerged of snipers shooting a Palestinian protester who was standing harmlessly in the distance as a soldier and his friends laughed and cheered at the shot. You may have heard the Israeli defense minister confirm that this was not an exception to the military culture, but was the encouraged practice saying that the snipers should be decorated and the photographers should be condemned. If it's not obvious to you, this is what counterterrorism looks like in Israel. It doesn't have anything to do with minimizing violence, but with expanding the definition of terrorism so broadly that it means standing around a fence that the government doesn't like you to stand around. Americans are already terrorized by state violence at protests. Remember the water cannons used in freezing temperatures on the indigenous people at Standing Rock, for example. Like the Palestinians, these were people who were standing up for their right to land stolen from under them. Instead of protecting us, our police grow more and more each year to look like soldiers, and the violence that is enacted upon their victims isn't treated as a crime, but as an unavoidable or even heroic action. Whatever these two forces will learn from each other, it won't make me feel safer. We should make Durham a leader in true safety and ban these exchanges. Thank you. We'll now hear from Ahmad Amira. Mr. Amira, you have two minutes. Ahmad Amira, 51 Brody Dim Drive, Go Duke. The Atlanta Police Department in 2014 said that Chief Davis's Atlanta exchanges, quote, include training where officers learn tactics on preventing acts of terror, end quote. The Atlanta mayor defended these exchanges with their counterterrorism focus, and Donald Trump has applauded Israel for its racial profiling and has even used Israel's apartheid system as justification for his border wall and for his Muslim ban. At this point, City Council needs to draw a clear line between counterterrorism and deadly racism. For Israel, the line blurs into one, and countless Palestinians have died as a result. Former Israeli Defense Minister Mashi Yalon has admitted to targeting civilians in Lebanon in 2006 and in Gaza in 2014. Current Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman recently claimed that, quote, there are no innocent people in Gaza after he authorized the murder of dozens of unarmed Gazan protesters. Durham needs to take a stance against the intentional murder of civilians and not glorify atrocity by claiming Israel is some expert in counterterrorism. The countless hours of interrogation every Palestinian faces when traveling through Israel is not counterterrorism. It's racism. Israel's airport security that uses a scale of one to six to identify an individual threat level is assigned by race. The six on my passport classifies me as an extreme threat to Israel. Calling me a terrorist just because I'm Palestinian, that's not counterterrorism. That's racism. Arresting teenagers in the West Bank like a head to Mimi for merely waving flags and throwing rocks like those. That's not counterterrorism. That's excessive force and that's deadly. I say, let's not glorify the deadly racism that Israel imposes upon the Palestinians it illegally occupies. Don't let the suffering the Palestinians face under the Israeli military become some model for policing in America. Reject racial profiling, reject police militarization, and put our black and brown communities here in America first. Black lives matter. We need to reach a point where those words represent the widely accepted truth and not some distant goal. Let's make a difference. Let's demilitarize Durham and free Palestine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mike Ross. We won't take your two minutes for that, Mr. Ross. Thank you very much. Mr. Ross, you have two minutes. 
Thank you, Mayor and City Council members for allowing me to speak. I had three main points, which I may not get to. First, JVP's pervasive demonization of Israel, as we see tonight, is a recipe for unending conflict. The anti Two, the Anti-Defamation League, the premier Jewish organization fighting for social justice, has been targeted by JVP's initiative. And three, as we witness today, JVP is bringing the conflict and discord from the Middle East to our city council. First, in the petition, JVP disgracefully claims a direct link between US police training in Israel to deliberate oppression of minorities here. That is, there is absolutely no evidence for that smear, and teaching such hate will never lead to peace. Tonight, they will hijack this forum, as we've seen, to attack Israel. They will make claims which are, are accusing the one Jewish state of being entirely evil. Make that, a, a, make that a, a, a what you will. But their statements will be a steady stream of accusations, more about instilling blame than being constructive. Mutual respect comes from cooperation and compromise, not continued incitement and conflict. Second, JVP has attacked the ADL. The ADL, which sponsors trainings for police to combat hate crimes, to counter implicit bias, and to build trust with communities. Their courses in Israel focus on Israelis' balancing of security concerns with the imperative to uphold civil rights. It is a gross inversion of reality to claim that the ADL is complicit in oppressing people of color. Third, as we see today, JVP is bringing the conflict to us. They are sowing division in the community by telling minorities that Israel and its supporters are to blame for police brutality against them. This lie leads to distrust, division, and inevitably hatred. I'd rather envision a Durham that is inclusive and tolerant. In summary, please do not support their divisive agenda. Please continue to be a welcoming city. Don't listen to people, either from the right or from the left, who want to tell you what to be afraid of and who's to blame for it. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Adam Goldstein. Uh, Adam Goldstein, uh, Ukiah Lane, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Thank you for allowing me to speak today, and thank you for your service on behalf of the people of Durham. My name is Adam Goldstein. I'm a family physician. I've been involved in multiple leadership positions in the Durham Chapel Jewish community for almost two decades, including being past president of the Learner School in Durham, past president of the Durham Chapel Jewish Federation that supports over 5,000 Jewish families in this region and in Israel. And I'm chair of the statewide North Carolina Hillel and 13 campuses throughout North Carolina for Jewish life on campus. Why do the majority of Jewish organizations and synagogue leaders see your current statement as anti-Israel and anti-Zionist? And why do some see overtones of anti-Semitism? These concerns as applied to Israel are not simply criticism, because we are all willing to criticize, as we are here in the United States at times, but it's when policies or statements are done that seek to delegitimize, demonize, and apply double standards to Israel. They're almost always done under the shadow of extreme prejudice, whether from the hatred and lies of the far right or the far left. The petition, which became a statement, started with the premise that was false and demonizing, and six council members signed it. Despite changing the petition to the statement, please take ownership that the sponsorship of the petition in this entire episode is designed to single out one country and one country only, not Iran, Syria, North Korea, China, or Russia, but Israel. You do so in conjunction with an organization known to demonize Israel, and you do so in a way that will harm Jewish life on campus and towns in North Carolina and Durham moving forward. Finally, you had the completely distorted the Durham Police Department's chief glowing statement on Israel. Trying to take one sentence out of context to support a view is not truly honest. You brought these petitions up during the Jewish holidays of Passover and right before the Jewish memorial in Israel for fallen soldiers. The whole statement starting from a petition for an issue that doesn't even exist, along with your failure to consult with multiple Jewish leaders to discuss this impact, along with continuing to keep the name of Israel in the statement and distorting the police chief statement are blights on this great city unless changes are made tonight. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Minister Rafiq Zaidi Muhammad. Sir, you have two minutes. Good evening. To this council of deals and local government body, I am Rafiq Zaidi Muhammad. I reside at 807 South Duke Street, Durham, North Carolina. I am a Muslim believer, a follower of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, in the nation of Islam. I have been on the forefront with the Palestinian brothers and sisters in this country since 1975. 
I went to jail in Chicago for standing up for the Palestinian demonstration. But first and foremost tonight, I want to say this. I thank counsel very deeply from my heart because the move that you have made to approve this petition was one against forces that are unseen. There's a synagogue of Satan that's always lingering in the background as the book of Revelation, the second, the third, and the third and the ninth say. They propose to be of the righteous, but they are a synagogue of Satan. And I want to say this to you tonight, first and foremost. Let it be known that as a citizen of the nation of Islam and a resident of the city of Durham, I support the petition to prevent police exchanges between the Durham Police Force and the Israel, Israel Defense Forces, known as IDL. My words tonight, in the last 30 seconds, may draw widespread criticism from some in the community. But I am obligated to point out the inordinate control that some Jews have over the political system in this city. And I praise you and thank you for the inherent effort that you have made to make this proposal one that we all can deal with and stand firm on. Thank you very much, and may, may Almighty God, Allah, bless you and continue to in, intervene in all our affairs. Thank you. Minister Zaidi, I'm one of those Jews. I just want you to know that. I'm one of those Jews, Mr. Zaidi. Please be seated. That is, I, I can't describe that as anything other than anti-Semitism. And just as I would speak out, excuse me. Just as I would speak out against that, anything said about any other group, I'm afraid I'm going to have to speak out when it's said against a group of which I'm a member. I don't appreciate it. Don't bring it in here again. Mr. Raboy, you have two minutes. Please hold the clock until I get my PowerPoint up. Help you, help, yeah, sure, go ahead. Can, can I get some help? Um, I, I expect that they're they're about to run out and help you. That's what usually happens. So just give them a second, and, and the staff will be out here to give you a hand. Yeah, I'm just trying to... Hang on one second. Believe Thank me. You. Thank you. Hi. This one right here. Is this the advance button? Yes, sir. Okay. Good. Thank you. First, I want to say, uh, my name is Stanley Robboy, uh, Circle Park Place in Chapel Hill. This whole process, to me, has been very bothersome. Uh, the petition that was brought was actually signed, the petition, by six of the members of this council. And some of the members of the council actually helped uh, formulate the petition. In addition, uh, there's a specific email that one of the council members sent. Thought I'd send this in case it has any use for future BDS purposes. Is my PowerPoint actually showing? Yes. Okay. Is this? We can we can see it, Mr. Robboy. Pardon? We can see it. Yeah, how does this go forward? Won't go forward. There okay, go. there it is. The last meeting that was held two weeks ago to me was a sham meeting. Several of us were called. We were given three minutes. We were thought we we're talking about the petition. At 1:25, we finished speaking. At exactly 2:35, ten minutes later, the city council produced a statement that was given to the newspaper, a long statement. Uh, that clearly could not have been written in 10 minutes. It was at least the day before. The chief's statement, as far as I'm concerned, was full of praise and much was suppressed. This is what she wrote. And there are types of words that are saying, it builds community, police relations, helps homeless, uh, highly academic. All of that was left out. The only thing was, we're not gonna have a relation with Israel which does not sound like what the chief meant. Then at the same time, suddenly came this by the, by the same group that's here. It's on the web, and it says, 
no more police at Jewish synagogues. And in fact, it says there should be no more police departments. We might like to not to have police, but just imagine what we would have in this country with no police departments at all. We single out here only Israel. But look at all the other countries, some 25. Your time's up, Mr. Raboy. Thank you. Peter writes us, and then we will have Reverend Curtis Gatewood, and then I'm going to call some other names that can assemble over behind Mr. Gatewood. Um, Bob Gutman, Michelle Laws, Buddy Bomsey, I'm sorry if I haven't got your name right there, Robert Hollister, and Rhino Rachel Golper. If you all would please make your way over there behind Minister Gatewood, that would be great. Uh, and in the meantime, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm being told I'm not being loud enough, for which I'm often not. Let me say it again. Thank you very much, Dr. Allison. I will try to be louder. Reverend Gatewood will, will be followed by Bob Gutman, Michelle Laws, Buddy Bomsey, Robert Hollister, Rhino Rachel Golper. Yes, sir, Mr. Reitzes, thank you. Thank you. My children's synagogue school in Durham not too long ago was faced with a bomb threat. The Durham police were there. I'd like to be the first person tonight to thank the Durham police for everything you do every day. <clears throat> Councilperson Jillian Johnson said something that I think everyone in this room can agree upon. She recently said that it is not anti-Semitic to criticize Israeli policies and practice. But let me tell you what is anti-Semitic. This month, the city council received an email from one of the petitioners, and the email listed what the petitioner called savage military countries. And the petitioner said Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Colombia, and Costa Rica, just to name a few, there were about 20 countries. This city council ignores all of those countries that the petitioner says. And this city council says, let's focus on Israel, the only Jewish majority country on the planet. My friends, that is anti-Semitism. Singling out Israel and forgetting about everybody else, that is anti-Semitism. During President Obama's administration, the Obama State Department defined anti-Semitism in relation to Israel with three examples, demonizing Israel, delegitimizing Israel, and holding Israel to double standards. If this council passes your statement tonight, you are doing all three things that the Obama administration said are anti-Semitic. I ask one thing, remove all mention of Israel from your statement. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Reverend Gatewood, you have two minutes. Please tell us your name and address, sir. Yes, I'm the city council you familiar with. The church say amen. Amen. First, I'm Reverend Curtis Gatewood. I reside at 129 West Front Street, Oxford, North Carolina. I'm the founder of Justice Ministrations, which is justice being the acronym for Jesus Uniting Souls to Increase Community Engagement. I'm also founder of Stop Killing Us Solutions Campaign. The basis for which I stand in solidarity with those who support the resolution is driven by my adamant opposition to the militarization of the police department in Durham or anywhere else in the world, first. 
and I'm not aware of the city's current plans as they relate to the militarization uh, training for the Durham Police by the Israeli Defense Force, or IDF, but I am aware of the history, which may date back to 2008, with Police Chief Lopez. Therefore, the lack of clarity of the city's current position regarding the, the militarization of the police department and the Israeli Defense Force necessitates the need for a resolution now to lay to rest any question. First reason being, if the Israeli Defense Force will use excessive force and wrong for death toward their own Palestinian neighbors, what makes us think they can train Durham police to treat the struggling citizens of Oxford Manor, Bracktown, Medugal Terrace, Liberty Street, or turnkey, right, except to kill us or to turn the key to lock us up. What we would like to see is IDF know that the Durham East End and the West End are struggling to make ends meet. Thank you very much, Minister Gatewood. <clears throat> Mr. Bob Gutman, you have two minutes. How do I start this? Uh, Hang on a second and someone will come help you. I'll get started. I have a picture of a baked cake on the first slide um, because we know the cake is baked. And we're very sad about it because the name Israel was insisted on being there. In the lead up to the petition initially presented, it was very clear that JVP, a notoriously anti-Zionist organization, included its chosen language to defame Israel. This is a national program that's been going on several years, and you are supporting it by inserting the name Israel almost gratuitously. I have, that's it, thank you. I have to ask, what was the point? What, did that, what purpose did that serve the city of Durham? It's great to have a very well formulated and very clear, kind, uh, and thoughtful police policy, but why do you have to mention Israel? It, only because you have decided to insert yourself in national and international politics for the sake of these people who come and notice that they have all said the same thing we're saying. They have all declared that they're for this because it defames Israel. Just the same thing we're saying. They don't need to do that or you don't need to do that, they do need to do that because that's what the national organization wants to happen. I just want to go, I was going to go through a bunch of slides showing you how many people on their side support what I'm saying. But I do want to just end by saying that when Mayor Shul ran, he gave two promises. Strong support for Chief Davis's emphasis on de-escalation and racial equity training. That's a promise properly being kept. The next, another statement is, quote, I will continue to work toward a police force that effectively fights violent crime while actively seeking to build the trust of our entire community. That's a promise that needs to be kept. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gutman. We'll now hear from Michelle Laws. Ms. Laws. You have two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the um, City Council. I really just want to come and offer my um, approval and, and uh, just my hats off to the police chief for standing in a very difficult and uncomfortable place. I am a Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, loving Christian. The God I serve says that he has no respect of person. I come from a history, a family, a, a, um, a group of people who understand the danger of us holding on to these narratives embedded in historical documents, often revisionist histories, and our own interpretations of what the Lord means. The same slaveholders who held us captive and used my ancestors to create 
the largest profit margin in the world's economy, and we've never lost our footing as a nation since those almost 300 years of free labor were given, justified that by their religious doctrines. I also come because I do know that now is the time for us to be very clear as a nation, as a city, as a state on where we stand in terms of the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. Far too many children and women and disabled and elderly are losing their lives because men on both sides are refusing to come to the table and reason together as the good Lord our creator has called us to do. And in terms of Israel, the United States entered in 2016 an agreement, a 10-year military assistance agreement with Israel that is worth over $38 billion. The diplomatic and military alliance between our two countries is incestuous, and it is the largest cumulative recipient Israel is of US foreign assistance since World War II. Israel is not hurting in any kind of way, and largely it's because of we, our complicity. Thank you. Thank but you very children much. children are, and women are. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Laws. We will now hear from Buddy Bomsey. I'm sorry I haven't gotten your name right. Uh, you have two minutes. That's correct. Hello, my name is Buddy Bomsey, and I'm a lifelong Durham resident. I've attended charter and public schools, and I am now a junior at the North Carolina School of Science and Math. I have been active in local government for two years as a member of the Durham Youth Commission, and I am Jewish. I am here tonight to speak to the City Council about the proposed statement regarding training of members of the Durham Police Department in Israel. Last week, a coalition of groups, many of which have missions that I support, presented a hateful petition to the Durham City Council called Demilitarize from Durham to Palestine. This petition contained allegations that Israeli training of American police forces assists them in the practices of racism and racial profiling. Anyone who has studied American history knows that white supremacy and racism and the violent behavior related to such ideas has been ingrained in American society for more than four times as long as Israel has existed as a sovereign nation. From the time immediately after the Civil War up until the early 20th century, Southern police forces would arrest African Americans on baseless charges and then sell them via their, their bail price into neo-slavery. The claim that Israel influenced American racism is simply disingenuous. In response, Mayor Steve Shul crafted a statement in support of the petition. Though he does not directly mention Israel, some council members feel that by omitting Israel, his statement does not go far enough in meeting the goals of the petition. The proactive nature of this movement and the Durham City Council's response when the Durham Police Department and Israel do not have a relationship in any capacity lead me to believe that the most important goal of this petition is not the quality or improvement of our police force. These actions lead me to believe that the goal of this petition is to demonize and ultimately blight Israel. Further evidence of this goal is that a number of the supporting organizations believe in the boycott divestment sanctions movement, which though advertised as an effort to support peace in the region does no such thing. I am not here because I unanimously, unanimously support Israel in any, in all situations or, or all policy decisions. But I cannot stand by as the state of Israel is slandered by false accusations or as my city government promotes such assertions. This petition is nothing more than a gratuitous attempt to, to have our progressive city participate in the last socially acceptable form of discrimination. I ask you to go no further in responding to this petition. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now hear from Robert Hollister and then uh, Ms. Galper after her, after him, and then uh, after, then we will be followed by these people and these will be our last speakers in order, please, over to the right. Um, Ron Baron. I believe this person's already spoken. This person's already spoken. Beth Brooke and Deborah Rosenstein, and those will be our last speakers. If anyone is, feels that they've already signed up and I didn't call their name, you can uh, let me know. Uh, you called in, okay. D Dr. Allison, we'll get you. Thank you, we'll get you up here, thank you. Okay, um, sorry about that, Mr. Hollister. Uh, welcome and you have two minutes. Thank you. My name is Robert Hollister. I live on North Lakeshore Drive in Chapel Hill, but I'm here as a representative of the Justice Ministry Council 
of the Eno River Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, which is on Garrett Road here in Durham. Our goal is to, de is to develop and support a vibrant local community based upon diversity, opportunity, equity, support, and protection. The realization of these goals depends to a considerable extent on the qualities of our police and judicial systems because these are the institutions that either support or destroy public perceptions of trust, fairness, equity, and respect, which are the glue that hold us together as a society and as a community. Of particular concern is the increasing militarization of our police forces. These practices include training in military tactics, the provision of military-style assault rifles, combat dress, and the military equipment such as armored personnel carriers and mine-resistant and ambush protection vehicles. In your consideration of tonight's resolution, we respectfully request that the Durham Council consider the following. Number one, the adoption of policies that prohibit the militarization of the local police force. Number two, policies that prohibit the police force from applying to the Pentagon for military equipment. And number three, policies that prohibit the provision of foreign training for police officers in military, military style procedures and tactics. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we'll hear from Ms. Gulper. Good evening, everybody. I'm sure it's been a long night. I'm very glad to be here. Um, so I, I, the coalition has asked me to say that um, just to affirm that we reject any support that comes from anti-Semitism and that this previous speaker making those comments is not a member of our coalition. And the other thing too, and uh, this is just something that's really near and dear to my heart, this is not a Jewish issue. This is a human rights issue, and it's not about, for me personally, being against Israel and being called anti-Semitic, and there's been a lot of vitriolic and insulting comments and attempts to fire people who have opinions that are different than the conventional Jewish community. This is a human rights issue because honestly, we do not need intervention from Israel or any other country to come and tell us how our police force should be run, counterterrorism, militarization of police. We don't need any help to, to shoot and kill unarmed civilians and demonstrators. We don't need any help from a country whose human rights abuses are documented and has a record that is as bad as our own. And so my hope is that we'll actually be the Durham that I know we are, and I know that your hearts are in the right place already, and I'm just hoping that we do the right thing. I think we need to run our own affairs, and we have a lot of work to do without help from a country that surely has not a lot to offer in this regard. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now hear from Ron Baron, followed by Beth Brook, followed by Deborah Rosenstein, and then we will hear from Dr. Livonia Allison, and that will be our last speaker. Um, Ron Baron, 208 North Driver Street. Um, I've been in Durham 15 years now. Um, I'm originally Israeli and I'm Jewish. And I want to speak very strongly in support of um, the resolution tonight. I spent a long, much of my life in Israel working with Palestinians. I grew up around Palestinians. Um, I was lucky to, to do so. My grandfather was one of the chief authors of the peace agreement with, uh, between Egypt and Israel. Um, in 2014, I was in Haifa during the Gaza war. We had a small demonstration opposing the war. We were saying slogans. I'll read them in Hebrew and English. <clears throat> in Gaza and in Sderot, girls want to live. Shalom Robonim al Gufotrum of Ginim. Peace is not built on demonstrators' bodies. We were our small demonstration was surrounded by over a thousand right wing demonstrators, including activists in a center left party, the Labour Party. 
Blicks were thrown at our heads. It was a miracle that no one was killed. The police barely intervened. Two days earlier, I was at a demonstration, a Palestinian demonstration for the same cause, which were, people were tear gassed, shot with rubber bullets, and beaten by the same Israeli police. The Israeli police is one of the most racist police forces on the planet, and I don't think we should have any, anything to do with them. At the same time, in the same time frame, our Durham police was busy tear gassing people in the streets, and I'm glad to see things have gotten better since. And I applaud Chief Davis for saying that no police exchange with Israel would take place. I urge you to make this formal policy tonight and to have nothing to do with the Israeli police ever again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we'll hear from Beth Brook. We have two minutes, Ms. Brook. Thank you. Um, I'm here as an American Jew. I've seen you at Shul. Um, and I'm just in support of this statement. Um, I want to just repeat that the Demilitarized Coalition is stating emphatically that we reject any support that comes from a place of anti-Semitism. We're an interfaith community that believes in de demilitarization of police here and abroad, and one step is stopping our well-documented participation in police exchanges. We know that Chief Lopez went on a trip. We know that Chief Davis um, headed up the exchange program when she was in Atlanta. This is a time to pass such a policy before anything has a chance to start here. Um, I also want to present you all with this letter from um, American Muslims for Palestine, Friends of Sabeel North America, and Jewish Voice for Peace, an interfaith clergy letter to Durham, which has already been turned into the clerk. Um, it's been signed by 50 rabbis of Jewish Voice for Peace, Rabbinical Council, and um, 72 religious leaders, additional religious leaders um, in Durham and North Carolina and the United States. So I want to give you all this statement in support of um, the, the, the campaign. Um, demilitarized Durham to Palestine campaign and in support of your proposed policy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Brooke. You may hand that to the clerk. Dr. Allison, welcome. You have two minutes. Thank you very much. I know I have two minutes, but uh, I had the occasion uh, to turn on my TV that ended up at C-SPAN 3. And I had to stop and listen because it was a group of persons hosted by J Street, a non-profit Jewish advocacy group. Then the next person was the Palestine Liberation Organization. And I heard some fantastic speakers speaking about how terribly they have treated the Palestinians. And I'm here to thank you all that I came out tonight, I don't even need to be here. But I hope and I thank those of you who put this together. Because at this point in time, it reminds me of two gentlemen that I had an opportunity, Jewish, Cecil Sheps, UNC Chapel Hill, organized something to help us try to figure out how we're going to improve the representation of black health professionals. Betty Greenberg, another one chair of the social work at Chapel Hill. And I was glad to come up here and say something positive. But you know, this is about peace. This is about doing what's right, not what's wrong. And I'm glad the police situation and all that came up and brought me out. Because so I wouldn't, you know, we recently celebrated Martin Luther King. Basically, he was against militarism, racism, and above all, poverty. You know, it's so much that's happening to right now in those of us who are here saying, do your thing and stand on it. When you do something right, you're not anti-Israel. But if they're doing wrong, you have to stand up and say it. I, I'm not going to take much time, but I, I have some articles that I want you all to read. And I want to recommend North Carolina Regiment of Racial Subordination Hindering Blacks. The story is here, gentrification. At this point, do what you're doing what's right. The peace problem, the peace thing started a long time ago. They were almost at it. Thank you, Dr. Allison. We were almost at it till they pulled somebody up and they threw me off. Thank you, Dr. Allison. Um, is Deborah, excuse me, is Deborah Rosenstein here? Okay. Ms. Rosenstein, Ms. Rosenstein, I'm not sure which it is, but you'll tell me, and we're glad to have you. Please tell us your name and address. 
Thanks. Um, my name is Deborah Rosenstein. I live on Davis Road in Hillsboro, North Carolina. Um, I wasn't going to speak tonight um, until I saw how charged things have become around Jewishness, uh, anti-Semitism in Israel, and I knew I needed to speak. Uh, um, so while I stand before all of you as a Jewish person whose great-great-grandparents were murdered in their beds, actually, in, in a pogrom, um, I come before you as someone uh, who's a human being in this community and in North Carolina at this moment, and I'm terrified of how militarized our police departments are becoming. And I really appreciate um, Javier and everyone where this, where this started from with being about ICE. And to me, that's what this is about. Um, I hope people here tonight have mentioned that they're scared that you all are being manipulated and that this might spread. I hope this spreads because all of us who care about fighting racism and all of us who care about trying to have democracy maintained or exist in this country, we need to not have militarized police forces. The other thing I want to mention is that people have said, why are we picking on Israel in particular? I believe this is true. I know it's true for me and others that, that I'm in coalition with here, that if any other oppressive government came forward to you all and tried to say, we want to train your police force, that we would stand up here. I will stand up here again. Um, but no one else is doing that right now, and no one else is receiving as much aid as we've talked about. So I guess uh, what I also want to say is people have mentioned that we want to be a welcoming community. I want Durham County to be that, Orange County to be that. We can't be a welcoming community if we're being, uh, if our police are being trained uh, in military anti-terrorist tactics. So I say that to you as a Jewish person, as a woman, as a queer person, but mostly I say it to you as a human being in North Carolina, and I'm, I'm frightened for what's happening in this country. Thank you. Thank you. All right, y'all can clap as much as you want. Now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Council members, you have heard the speakers, and I want to express my thanks to all the speakers. I want to especially express my thanks to the young speakers, the students who came on um, both sides of this issue. We had, we had a lot of young people, and they had very different opinions from each other, and I really appreciate the fact that you were starting young to speak your conscience uh, and it's, I think it's especially courageous in a, in a highly charged and controversial atmosphere, and, but you did it, and you did it very well, so I especially want to appreciate you. Council members, um, any, any comments at this point? Let me say that again. Council members, any comments at this point? Right if I start, I want to finish, just so you know. You have more than two minutes. <laughs> I just want to say that I really appreciate everyone coming out today and sharing their voice and uh, speaking up on your truth and recognizing that everyone's voice does matter here. It's important to us as a council to hear you. And um, I'm overwhelmed with a joy and a hurt in understanding the tension of how this statement has, is kind of fracturing our community. I'm also overwhelmed with the fact of who I am as a person, as a human being, acknowledging that I have to stand in solidarity with the people that I feel that are most impacted and recognizing that the people of color in this country who are dis disproportionately targeted, whether immigrant, whether black lives, whether Standing Rock, whether, I mean, the list goes on and on. The place of which where I come into this is that, and I have to stand and say that it's not okay. It's just not for us to support 
a militarized police force or training of a militarized police force, recognizing that we are trying to decriminalize our police forces here in Durham. And I think that the information that was shared, I, I mean, I'm thankful that it was said repeatedly, you know, the $38 million that's, that's paid to Israel as aid, billion, I'm sorry, billion dollars as aid, and the fact that it, I really wanted to ask staff about how do we have our city removed from their literature because it shouldn't be on there. I, um, I have no ill will towards Israel at all. I, I mean, I, I honestly and truly, I mean, as a human being, you just have to see that this is, this is not okay. And it falls in line with the way in which things have happened throughout the course of history. And we have to know that this is not, this is not for me a religious battle, battle. This is a human rights issue and recognizing that you cannot allow your, any armed person to shoot down someone else who is unarmed. Thank you. I'll let the rest of the council say something else. Thank you, Council Member Freeman. Thank you. Comments? Mr. Mayor. Council Member Middleton. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> how did we get here? Hmm. I want you to look at how many people are in this room tonight. How did we get here? Where a declaration of what we hold as sacred and valuable in terms of our policing, how did it get conflated with this issue? The United States of America is the only nation in history that has ever written down the words, all men are created equal. We're the only person that, people that, only act, that actually wrote that down. And any time I take an opportunity to point out where we failed in that, I'm not being unpatriotic. So the proposition that a critique of Israel as a nation state and as a bona fide geopolitical player on the world stage is tantamount to anti-Semitism is ridiculous. It's a ridiculous proposition. And Anyone who would, I'll meet anyone, anytime, anywhere that would like to debate my record in this city uh, and, and point out where it's been anything other than ecumenical and pro-justice. I'll have that debate anytime. With that said, I just went through a campaign. Many of us up here just went through a campaign. And I spoke to literally thousands of people. And I got to tell you, most of the people I spoke to we're not talking about exchanges between our police and Israel. They were talking about, can I get a job? Where am I going to live? Are the buses going to be running on time? So how did we get here? The statement, if you read it, and I, I want to exegete the actual statement a little bit, and then I'll yield. The statement, first off, it, 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 we didn't jointly write it, although I, many of us agree with it and agree with elements of it. We didn't pin it as a group. It wasn't a group project. But I want you to look at the statement. Firstly, Israel is mentioned within the context of a quote from the chief. The first paragraph is the chief talking about Israel. It's in quotes. The council did not single out Israel. The council is quoting the chief in her statement. And if I wanted to just single out Israel, I think it would have been a far more eloquent statement to strike the Council opposes international exchanges with any country in which Durham, of, of, Durham officers receive military-style training. If I wanted to just single out Israel, we should do away with that paragraph that mentions other countries. And let's really stick with it if we want to be that singular. I also want you to note something. It says that we oppose military-style training. Well, read that. Does that mean we can get training that's not military style? What does military style mean? This statement does not preclude exchanges with Israel that are outside of military style. So I, I want you to take a clear look at the statement. 
This is, for me, it would have been an opportunity for us to positively state how we feel about policing. But it's been conflated with an issue that there are people right now earning PhDs in different slices of this issue, religiously, politically, anthropologically. So to think that any statement, and I'm not, I didn't get elected to parrot the statement of any particular group on this issue. If you will note, this statement is not the, the statement that JVP submitted. It wouldn't have passed because some of us found it problematic, some of the things in JVP statement. This is not no action either. This is not verbatim what JVP submitted to us. It's a compromise. I think it could have been artful in some other ways, and, and, and there are some things I've spoken with my colleagues uh, offline and behind the scenes about it, but what I am encouraged about the statement is that, one, it's a, it's a positive statement of what we hold valuable in terms of policing. Now, I signed the petition, and by the way, the evening that we had, uh, there was a, um, a forum at, I believe it was the Haiti Heritage Center, uh, in which we were asked to sign it. There was no bunch of papers of text that we got from JVP on that evening. I signed it because I'm against uh, military, I'm, I'm against exchanges of the Durham police with Israel and any other nation. Our debate and machinations in this city about how we wanted policing did not occur in light of Israel. When we decided as a city how we wanted to be policed, we weren't talking about Israeli exchanges then. The chief answered the question about Israel. I'll tell you why. Because she was asked about Israel. I'm one of the people that asked her. I served on the committee that, that vetted our candidates to hire chiefs. She was asked specifically about Israel. She was asked specifically about Israel. Had she been asked about Syria or North Korea or Fiji, then she probably would have responded to any of those nations. So she was asked. So she responded. That's how Israel got in here. The council did not single out Israel. It's a quote. And in the next paragraph, we go on to say, or oh, any country, any country. I am deeply, 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 and I will put a button on it after this. I am deeply troubled by some of the rhetoric that has surrounded this debate. I'm deeply troubled uh, uh, by this mayor being called a Nazi sympathizer. I'm troubled by that. I'm troubled by friends, friends, people that I deeply respect, suggesting that the mere mention of a nation is somehow anti-Semitic. I'm offended by it because I've seen that tactic before in America as a black man living in America when you want to critique something. We're better than that. And the debate is better than that. And I think that many of us have, have allowed this debate to descend into a caricature. The issue of Palestine and Israel deserves a much deeper debate and a much more respectful one. I got news for you. Whether this uh, uh, statement passes or not, <laughs> Durham is not going to have military-style training with Israel or any other country. The chief said it before the statement came, and I believe the chief. I said to the mayor when we discussed this, one of the options is, why do we even have to respond? Do, do we have to say anything? I mean, there's a whole lot of groups in this city that write me emails every day that would love to have this council spend this much time on their issue. But when you got more money, when you're better organized, when it's a sexier issue, I guess you get our attention. I'm supporting this statement, um, not because I think it's perfect, not because I'm an anti-Semite, Fight me about it if you want. I'm supporting this statement because it's a positive statement of what we want as policing. And by the way, this fire started long before JVP or anybody else brought up the Israeli issue in Durham. We've been talking about how we want to be policed for years, and it was not done in tension with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It was not. I urge my colleagues to support the statement, and I urge this community to keep talking with each other instead of at each other. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Thank you, Council Member. Mm.
Thank you, Councilmember Middleton. Councilmember Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think you can see why I waited until after Councilmember Middleton spoke. Uh, you never want to go before that, but going you after. You never want to go either difficult. before or after Councilmember Middleton. It's, That's my it's, motto. So it's impossible. It's impossible to meant to navigate. Uh, Mr. Mayor, <coughs> I wanted to start. Uh, first of all, I, I intend to support the statement tonight. Mr. Mayor, I wanted to say how much respect I have for the way that you've navigated this particular issue. I know this has been personally difficult for you. As Councilmember Middleton mentioned, I was aghast uh, to read online uh, some of the things that were said about you in connection with this debate. Uh, I was also uh, deeply grateful for you, to you tonight for speaking out against some of the remarks we heard in this chamber uh, that were revolting, and I, I thank you for that. I know this has been um, a challenge. I think um, I also want to thank um, my colleagues who have uh, been with us every step of the way and uh, thinking about this and if it's your practice praying about it. Uh, I've spent a lot of time doing that over the last week and a half. I've also spent some time engaged in uh, email conversations with a number of the folks who uh, were deeply troubled by this statement. Um, I, I'm ashamed to admit I don't think I made any headway with those folks. Uh, in trying to explain uh, why I don't think the statement singles out Israel for the, for the reasons that were so eloquently expressed by my colleague, Councilmember Middleton, that I don't believe that the statement is uh, animated or uh, evinces any kind of anti-Semitic uh, feeling for, again, the reasons Councilmember Middleton said. Um, but I do believe it's important for us to talk to each other and to listen to each other, and for that I'm deeply grateful for the, to those folks who spoke with me both in person and over email. Um, you may come away from those conversations in this vote tonight thinking that that was a sham, that it meant nothing, um, but I, I'm just here to tell you as a person, as a human being, and as an elected official, that's just not the case. Um, the last thing I wanted to say about this, and I know we've been here a while, is that I, I personally, I don't believe that it makes Durham any safer to have our police officers go overseas overseas and receive military-style military training, no matter what country hosts that training. And for that reason, I intend to support the statement tonight. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you, Council Member Reeds. Council Member Caballero. I waited till after Mark Anthony Middleton. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to say that anti-Semitism is alive and well. Everyone in this room can recognize that. And this statement is not an example, at least to me, of anti-Semitism. I understand that people in this room may not agree with that. That is a difference of opinion. I want to share several people mentioned Latin American countries this evening uh, as, as examples of, of bad actors in the international stage. Let's just reflect on who actually trained and funded Those militaries, and this is not Israel, this is the United States. The first protest I ever went to was a School of the Americas protest in the late 1990s. It was around the training of Latin American soldiers by US military. This is an issue that is very near and dear for me. I am an immigrant because of military influence and a foreign power. I will vote for this statement I understand that it is hurtful, but at some point we need to move away from militarization period. And I don't think it's an authentic and honest conversation to say that what the United States does and what the Israelis do in forms of foreign policy is, is any, we don't want anything to do with that in our city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just have a couple of comments. I wrote and emailed to everyone a longer statement um, on this issue that I also read at our work session, and um, I'll put it online, and I don't want to read it again because it's almost 10 o'clock. Um, but I do want to make a couple of comments. Uh, the first is that we've been asked specifically by constituents in this community to speak on and deal with the issue of police exchanges with Israel, and that's not without basis. It is because these exchanges exist, because police leaders in Durham have been a part of them in the past. 
it is very true that this issue, even though we are being asked to deal with a very specific question, it is very true this issue has a broader political con context, but so does literally every single other issue, right? That larger political context, in my opinion, doesn't preclude me or this body or anyone else from speaking or having an opinion or taking action on an issue, because if it did, we would literally never do anything. Um, finally, there's a long history of people using the label of anti-Semitism to silence criticism of Israel, just as there is a long history of labeling people who criticize US foreign policy as unpatriotic. Um, and it is intended to create a chilling effect and silence dissent and critique. We all know real anti-Semitism when we see it and when we hear it. And we know that. We heard some earlier tonight. And so, and I know even more now. Shut up! <clears throat> Excuse me. Excuse me. There's a lot of men interrupting me right now. I noticed you didn't interrupt any of the men who spoke. Excuse me. Excuse me. You just tell us what you want us to do. S excuse me. I'm really going to have to ask everybody to please be respectful. We've all been listening a long time, and I know there's a lot of disagreement, and I know there's a lot of really strong feelings, but also everybody needs to listen respectfully, okay? So hold the applause, hold the shouts, and let's just talk, okay? <clears throat> Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I believe now even more that people know anti-Semitism when they see it and hear it based on the response to the anti-Semitism that we heard tonight. And that is not the response that we got to this statement. The majority of people who are here tonight, who have read Mayor Schull's statement, who have contacted us about it, even if they disagree with it, are not telling us that this is somehow demonizing Israel. Um, yeah, I'll be supporting the statement written by our mayor. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, I want to speak to, I guess, both sides of this group a little bit. Uh, and I want to start with speaking to the, um, the folks from Jewish Voice for Peace. And I really mainly want to speak to the Jews in the room, my fellow Jews. Um, but before I do that, I, I want to I speak to one particular aspect of this that I think is really salient and important and a great question that people um, who are against this statement are asking, which is, why Israel, why not North Korea or Syria? And I, I believe that the answer to that, and I think it's, it, is a, it is the right answer, is, has nothing to do with military aid. It has everything to do with the fact that uh, there aren't police exchanges that I know of with Korea or Syria. And the statement is very explicit in saying that we oppose all exchange, militarized exchange with other militarized police forces. But there are these exchanges with Israel, and we have had uh, our police chief uh, participate in them. So that's the reason, that's what's different. But let me now speak to, I wanna to speak to the folks from Jewish Voice for Peace about kind of how, what my experience of the last month has been with your campaign, maybe, maybe longer than a month, maybe it's really been several months. As far as we know, uh, former Chief Lopez did one training with the Israeli police. And from that one training, I feel like the folks in Jewish Voice for Peace have worked hard to give the impression that Durham's police department is intimately involved with training with the Israeli police. And I feel like you've sought to blame Durham's connection with the Israeli police 
for racially biased policing in Durham, and you've cited lots of incidents of purported police misconduct to support the claim. I feel really strongly that this is a basic misunderstanding of how racialized policing happens in America, including in Durham. We live in our own country with a history of racial oppression in all of our institutions. And the problems with discriminatory policing in our country, which have been enormous and which continue to be enormous, have virtually nothing to do with Israeli society and everything to do with our own. I have received lots of emails from people living here in Durham, good people, many of whom I know, which includes the following paragraph from an email that was sent out by Jewish Voice for Peace, and these people have been sending to me. I'm proud to live in Durham, and as a progressive city, we have no place training the police with the army of any state that has policies of occupation and apartheid. I want to make sure this does not happen again, so I'm asking you to take a stand. I probably got 50 emails that said that. It pains me, it pains me that so many people are being given the completely false information that our police have been training with the Israeli army and that this should not happen again. This is so untrue. Our police have not been training with the Israeli army. There's no factual basis for that. There's not even a rumor about it, <clears throat> except for this email. And is so damaging to the police community relations and everything that we're trying to accomplish. The truth matters. It especially matters in the era of Donald Trump. And no desire to win political advantage justifies making up stuff that isn't true about Durham's police department and then spreading that truth all over God's creation. Attacking our police department through falsehoods is only going to hurt our ability to continue the police reforms we are undertaking and is going to hurt our ability to build trust with our community, which is being told that our police have been training with the Israeli army and that this must not happen again. And I want to stress just for a minute those police reforms. I want to say what the statement says, just so you'll, you'll get it. So in the last few years, especially in the last couple of years, the number of traffic stops in Durham have gone from 33,000 to 11,000. The number of searches in Durham in the last two years has gone from 1,200 to 400. The number of drug arrests in that same period of time has gone from 1,200 to 600. These are real reforms that are really mattering. And one of the ways in which we make that happen as a city council is to have the backs of our police department when they're doing the right thing. And our community has to do the same. And every time you attack them falsely, you undercut our ability to win their trust so that we are able to support them in their reform. The other thing is this. I think that these kinds of exaggerations and sometimes falsehoods are damaging, my friends in Jewish Voice for Peace, to your own cause in another way. In this case, they drove a group of rabbis, a, a varied group of rabbis, but some of whom are very much against the Israeli occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, to write a letter claiming that you were demonizing Israel and denouncing your efforts in this petition. Those rabbis who wrote us, I know most of them, they're varied, we've heard tonight, you know, they're varied ideologically, but there are rabbis on that list who I know well, including my rabbi, who I have talked to about this in the last few days. There are rabbis on that list, this list who are against this policing, this, this policing connection, but yet they drove, they wrote us a letter denouncing what you all had done because they felt that, that you were saying things that weren't true. And so I would just say that, the, that telling the truth has really important positive effects uh, for the, what you want to do and the political movement that you want to create. If you want to make change in the American Jewish community's response to what is happening in Israel and Palestine, and you, then you have to be truthful. 
remember who we are as Jews. I'm 67, six years before I was born. It was the end of the Holocaust. Um, the Holocaust wiped out half of us on earth. And the prelude to the Holocaust and what made it possible was the lies that people told about the Jews and the ways in which the Jews were blamed for Germany's ills and the, and the ills of other country in, in the countries in Eastern Europe who participated with the Germans. So of course the Jewish community is sensitive to the lies, to lies that are told about us. And this, of course they have a special resonance. So I would just say again, it isn't contact with the Israeli police which has created racialized policing here in America. We have done that bad thing all on our own. Mm -hmm. To my friends in Voice for Israel, I understand as well as you do, maybe not as well as all of you do, but as well as many of you do, the emotional ties that bind us to Israel. I've traveled to Israel twice. Speaking of the Anti-Defamation League, my grandfather was president of the Anti-Defamation League in the southern part of this country for many years. I understand its value. And I understand why the Jewish Voice for Peace petition and, and accompanying rhetoric is so upsetting to you. Truth can't be a casualty in this discussion. And I would say to the folks in the Voice for Israel, that's also what's disappointing to me in, in a in your campaign. So I'll just mention a couple of things. In emails in a recent column in the Herald Sun, you have tried to delegitimize the process that has brought us here tonight. You misled people in this column and in the emails into thinking that there would not be an open forum to discuss our statement, that this was somehow orchestrated with Jewish Voice for Peace or somebody else, which couldn't be farther from the truth. From the truth. Was, if it was orchestrated at all, which I, I suppose you could use the word orchestrate, it was discussions that we all had in ones and twos over a couple of weeks to try to figure out what to do. And uh, I did have a statement ready at the last work session, and it did go to the media, but it, it wasn't anything but, a, but the same kind of discussion we have on every issue. And then to be followed tonight by a wide open forum where everybody got to say absolutely what they wanted to. This has not been fast-tracked, as you, as you have said, or other, anything other than a thorough and fair process in which all voices have been heard. In fact, I believe it's been an exceptionally open and patient process, and any implications to the contrary are false. And also to my friends in Voices for Israel, it isn't true as you have said, that the council publicly sided with those, this is a quote, the council publicly sided with those who falsely accused Israel of training the police to, quote, terrorize black and brown communities here in the U.S. The statement does not have any language like that, and you know it. I was impressed by my colleague, Jillian Johnson, at the work session when she explicitly rejected that assertion, and some of you all were there to attend that. The council statement has no rhetoric, anything like that, yet you have publicly and repeatedly says that it does. I know this issue strong, stirs strong emotions. I can't even describe to you the emotional roller coaster I've been on about this in the last few weeks. Believe me, I, I get it. But it doesn't help to say things that aren't true in order to whip up support for your side. So I'll say one thing that I have been really thinking about myself in terms of, you know, how to, what do, what do I have to say in terms of really being honest about this and the way this statement is positioned and that sort of thing. And one thing I will say to, 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 to a, a critique that Adam Goldstein uh, offered tonight and I've heard before, um, there's, it's no question that Chief Davis' entire statement says that she had a positive experience in her training with Israel. There's no question about that. 
when we put out the statement, when I mailed this, I mailed this, I, I don't know if I mailed it or I handed out the statement to the, to the, um, to the press, I also provided Chief Davis's entire letter. But I do think it's important to say that. I also take Chief Davis's words at face value, that she has no intention of having police exchanges with Israel. She is a very direct and strong person, and our statement endorses that stance. I agree with that stance. And I know that is where I differ from you, my friends, and voices for Israel. As our statement says, we want our police to have the kind of training that promotes the police work we are trying to do here in Durham under the leadership of our truly outstanding police chief. And I'll, might I also add, under the leadership of our city manager, who was really who hired Chief Davis and has really made this happen. I don't believe that training with the Israeli police will further that kind of policing. And I also believe that, that there are other countries, other training with other countries that have militarized police will not help as well either. If it happens that there is a possibility of that, I'm sure that you will hear the council taking a stand on that. I am a Jew and I am a Zionist. I believe in the existence of a Jewish state. I fear for its survival. But I know the terrible traumas visited on us as a people. We are now visiting on others in Gaza and on the West Bank. And to me, not only are our mortal souls in danger because of that, but I also believe that the survival of the Jewish state is dependent on doing justice to the Palestinians, and I do not believe that we are. And when I say we, I believe, I include myself. So that is the context in which I view this statement. Um, and I have appreciated everything I've heard tonight, and uh, I'm now going to ask if there's a motion on this statement. So moved. Been moved. Second. Second. Been moved and seconded that we approve the statement. Any more discussion? If not, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. The motion passes 6 Thank 0. You. Thank you. We'll now move to we'll now we'll now move to we'll now move to the next order of business. Well, I didn't know that was allowed. Ten o'clock, I think it is. Oh, the ten o'clock rule. Yeah. I now need to go do something I've had to do. <laughs> Laverne, I'm gonna give you these, dear heart. Can I have? Can I? Can I ask you to please uh, give us some quiet, please, so we can proceed with our business? Thank you. We're going to proceed with our business. Could you all, if you're if you're staying, we'd love to have you. We're going to do some fascinating public hearings. If you do not want to stay, I ask you to please leave the chamber quietly, so we can get going. Thank you so much. Okay. Now we're going to. Proceed with the first public hearing item, which is item 21, Unified Development Ordinance Text <laughs> Design District Streetscape Alternative. And I'm going to welcome Mike Stock. Glad to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Michael Stock with the Planning Department. Um, maybe I'll give it a minute. Okay. Um, before I begin, I would like to note that all uh, required notification for planning department public hearing items have been performed and on file for review. Text amendment TC 170007 is a privately initiated amendment to the Unified Development Ordinance submitted by Tim Somerville of Stewart LLC to develop alternative design standards for streetscape amenities within design districts. Current design district standards DD and CD initially adopted in 2010 with subsequent amendments prescribe specific amenities for streetscapes within the public right-of-way, benches, receptacles, street trees, and et cetera, and in many instances, specific design or standards for the amenity. The request is to allow for an alternative set of standards for a large contiguous area within a design district. The items include, in, some, in short, 
requiring an alternative streetscape plan with specific parameters, minimum plan area of 10 acres, contiguous and continuous block bases to minimize patchwork areas, agreements with property owners and successors for the provision, servicing, and maintenance of those facilities, and specificity as to what amenities can be altered with explicit text indicating base requirements apply unless otherwise noted or altered. The Joint City County Planning Committee reviewed the request, including a staff amended draft at its January 3rd, 2018 meeting and indicated no <coughs> concerns with the proposal. The Planning Commission recommended approval 14 to zero of the text amendment on February 13th. As a reminder, City Council required to take two actions. The first would be an action on the appropriate statement of consistency found in attachment B. The second would be an action on the ordinance amendment itself, attachment C. Uh, thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any applicant is is also here in the audience. Thank you very much. You've either heard or not heard the report from staff. Uh, but thank you very much, Mike. Uh, now, uh, council members, um, I'm going to declare this public hearing open, and I'm going to first ask if there are any comments by members of the council or questions for staff. I believe that I hear none, and I don't think there are any comments on this item. Oh yes, there are, I apologize. There are comments. Um, I'm gonna wait just a second so we can get some quiet. Again, I wanna thank our fire marshals and appreciate you for what you're doing back there. Um, we have two speakers who are both proponents of this text amendment. One of them is Tim Summerlee. I'm sure I can't read the name. And the other is George Stanzial. Um, you all are both proponents of this text amendment. Uh, and I believe that this was a, an, an amendment that was uh, privately initiated and that you all were part of that. That's correct. And so I suppose you're here to say that. We're just here to say that we're here for any questions. Okay. We did initiate it and um, uh, so any questions we're here to answer. Thank you very much. Council members, any questions for uh, Mr. Stanz Stanzial or Mr. Summerley or for staff? Thank you very much. Any more comments from the public? Any comments from the public on this? Okay, hearing none, uh, any questions from the council? All right, hearing no, que no questions from the council, uh, I'm gonna close this, declare this public hearing is closed and the matter is back before the council. Uh, we are asked here to uh, adopt a consistency statement and to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. Uh, is there a motion to adopt the uh, appropriate consistency statement? Move to adopt consistency. Second been moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much. Uh, now we need a motion to adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. Move to adopt. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the ordinance amending United Development, United Unified Development Ordinance. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Close the vote. <clears throat> Motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Mike. Mike, I'm sorry you had to stay so long, but much appreciated. Um, all right. Item 22, uh, next public hearing item, zoning map change for Lumley Road Assemblage. And Jacob, let me say in advance to you the same thing. I said to Mike, which we appreciate you staying so long. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mayor and the Council. Um, good evening. Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Department. Um, a zoning map change request has been submitted by Andrew Porter for four, four properties, generally located at 4138 Lumley Road. Um, the subject site is presently designated as office on the future land use map, and the applicant is proposing to change this designation to office and institutional um, which would then mirror the present designation of office on the future land use map. There was no development plan submitted in conjunction with this request. Attachment seven in your packet does list the permissible uses in the office and institution zoning district. 
I'm at the February 13th, 2018 meeting of the Durham Planning Commission. The commission recommended approval by a vote of 13 to zero. Staff finds that the request is consistent with the future land use map and applicable policies and ordinances, and notes that there are two motions required to adopt this item, the first being a consistency statement, and the second being the zoning ordinance. And I'll be happy to answer any questions the council may have at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. Wiggins. Um, you have heard the uh, report from staff. I'm now going to declare this public hearing open, and I'm first going to ask if there are any questions from members of the council for staff. Hearing none, uh, we do have one speaker on this item, uh, Neil Ghosh. Uh, Mr. Ghosh, you are a proponent, uh, and uh, I suppose I start out by giving you five minutes and hope that you don't take it all. Yeah, I don't plan on taking all that. Good evening, Mayor Shul, Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, and members of the City Council. My name is Neil Ghosh. I'm an attorney with the Morningstar Law Group here at, uh, in Durham, 112 West Main Street. I'm here tonight representing Darlington Advisors, and with us we have Carlton Midget, who is the manager for Darlington. And we also have uh, Andy Porter with Coulter Jewel Thames, the landscape architect on this project. I want to thank staff for their presentation. I think they gave a great overview of the project. I have just a few things to add. I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, the site is only eight acres and is designated for office on the future land use map. Uh, the requested OI district is consistent with the future land use map and no comprehensive plan amendment was necessary. Uh, regardless, we had a neighborhood meeting which was well attended and, and we were happy to find out that our neighbors did not oppose the project. Now, we view the OI district as a real positive in this location primarily for three reasons. Yes, First, there's a strong demand for office use in this area. A recent report from the Triangle Office Market states that office vacancy rates near RTP and RDU is only 3.6%, which is very low. The second reason is that in addition to office type uses, OI zoning allows for townhomes and there is strong demand for townhomes in Durham and particularly in this market. For example, uh, the West Briar Towns community, which is about a mile away, the units there sell before they're even built. So there's a possibility this site could successfully be developed for townhomes. Uh, finally, given the context of the area, the OI zoning makes sense. Uh, south and west of the property, the land is zoned IL, industrial. Uh, across Lumley, just north of the site, the land is zoned RR. And east of the site, there's a neighborhood, but it is actually zoned OI. The current RR zoning on the parcel is basically a hole in the zoning map, and uh, it doesn't give a reasonable opportunity to develop the site in a desirable way given the industrial zoning to the south. The, re the requested OI district would also serve as a far better transition between the industrial zoning to the south and the, and the RR neighborhood north of Lumley, and from a planning standpoint, that just makes more sense. So we hope you will agree with us and with the Planning Commission. We had a unanimous recommendation for approval, and we respectfully ask for your approval on this matter tonight. Our team is available to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Gage. Council members, any question for the applicant or for staff or any comments? This is a question for staff. Mm -hmm. Council member Freeman. Sorry. Has a development plan been submitted? No, ma'am. There is no development plan with this project. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Apparently, Mr. Ghosh, you were exceptionally persuasive. Um, all right. Uh, any more comments from members of the public? Does anyone else want to comment on this? All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm now going to declare this public hearing closed, and the matter is back before the council. Uh, we are two items we are asked for here. One is to adopt the consistency statements required by NCGS 168-383. And the other is to adopt an ordinance to amend the NFI development ordinance to take the property out of residential rural zoning and establish offices and institutional zoning at the subject site. Do I have a motion on the consistency statement? Move to adopt consistency. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Is there, an, is there a motion to adopt the ordinance to amend the Unified Development Ordinance? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the ordinance to amend the UDO. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. 
Motion passes 5-1. Thank you very much. Um, all right. With we, Council Member Freeman voting no. Thank you. Thank you. I should have waited for that. I apologize. Thank you very much. Now we'll move to item 23, consolidated land use item for 410 Crutchfield Street. Um, and we will first hear from staff, Mr. Wiggins. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Department. Um, requests for a future land use map amendment and zoning map change have been received from Kim Griffin Jr. for two parcels totaling approximately 1.7 acres located at 410 and 492 Crutchfield Street. The subject site is presently designated as medium high density residential on the future land use map and is zoned residential urban five. Mr. Griffin proposes to change these designations to office on the future land use map and office and institutional on the zoning map. No development plan was submitted in conjunction with this request, um, and if approved, the request would allow any uses allowed in the OI district. Attachment seven in your packet provides a list of those permissible uses. The Durham Planning Commission at their February 13th, 2018 meeting recommended denial by a vote of seven to six on this item. Staff has determined that the request is consistent with the future land use map comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Three motions would be required for action on this item. The first is to adopt a um, resolution amending the future land use map. The second would be the consistency statement and then the third the zoning ordinance. And I'm happy to answer any questions that the council may have at this time. Thank you Mr. Wiggins. I do have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, on the memo on the first page says as you just did that the Planning Commission rejected this by a vote of seven to six. Yes, sir. Uh, but at the end of the memo, it says that they approved it by a vote of eight to six. It, it doesn't, I mean, I'm gonna be listening to everybody and deciding on my own, but that did strike me as uh, something I'd like to know. It is an error on my part, and I apologize. The, the Planning Commission recommended approval eight to six of this item. It did, so the, so the, 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 the planning commission recommended eight to six approval, Correct. but the seven to six that, so it's the seven to six on the first page that's in error. Exactly. Okay, yes, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? Um, I don't know if I opened the public hearing. I apologize. I, I now declare this public hearing open. You've heard from staff. Uh, any questions from staff by members of council at this point? Just specifically on the proffers. Where, I, I noted that there were two, but I, I'm not sure what they were. Proffers? Yeah. There, there's no development plan associated with this, Councilman Freeman, so there's no ability to proffer any items with this zoning map change request. Okay. Um, all right. Any other questions from Council before we hear from our residents? All right. We have, we have four people signed up to speak on this. We have three people to sign up as <coughs> proponents. Uh, they are Kim Griffin Jr., Jim Wise, and Dan Jewell. And we have one person signed up as an opponent, which is Joe Hackett. Uh, I'm going to. Mr. Mayor, he's not. Proponent? Okay, then you should have checked that. <laughs> All right. Uh, we have four proponents. Is there anyone here? who is here to speak against this development. Anyone here to speak against this development or this, this change, this zoning change? Anyone here? All right. Uh, I'm going to uh, give each, I'm going to give the uh, proponents uh, 10 minutes. And again, I hope you won't take it all. <laughs> you all have a total of 10 minutes. You can split it up any way you want. Mr. Griffin, welcome. Thank you. I'm Kim Griffin, 1816 Front Street. I'm with Griffin Associates Realtors. I had the property for sale. The York Wright Masonic Bodies bought this property in 1950 to build a lodge on. They have since determined that that's not uh, where they need to put their lodge. And they asked me to sell the property. They asked me why no one had purchased it. And I said that uh, basically no one wanted to go through the zoning process in Durham because the folks that have approached me the most are medical users. And we started the zoning process to change it to office institutional. We have had two neighborhood meetings. 
we have had a lot of good neighborhood support and the neighbors uh, the same mindset as the uh, Masonic Lodge. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Jim Wise, the neighbor who is a <coughs> proponent and has been waiting for several hours. Thank you. Mr. Griffin, <coughs> Mr. Griffin, before you step down, can I just ask you if you wish you were still up here as a member of this august body and could have enjoyed this meeting tonight? No, I told my wife this morning I was not looking forward to this. Okay. Well, we're glad to have my you. my four years here. We're glad to have you back in these chambers, Mr. Griffin. Yeah, Mr. Wise. Good evening, Mayor Shule, members of the City Council. My name is Jim Wise. I live at 207 West Carver Street. I've lived there for 36 years. My house is a couple of blocks from the property in question here, and as a homeowner and a longtime neighborhood resident, I not only have no objection to the requested change of land use designation and zoning, I positively hope that you will approve them. Why this uh, large property is designated in zone uh, RU5 residential, I don't really know, but it bears no resemblance or very little to what's on the ground up there on Crutchfield Street. Crutchfield is four blocks long. Fronting on the north side, there is a picnic shelter, two residences in the 200 block, one of which is a garage appointment, apartment that actually belongs to a home fronting on Turrentine Street, and six office buildings. On the south side, there's a medical office building, Durham Center Access, the City of Medicine Academy, and Duke Regional Hospital. Developing the York Wright property, if it's to be developed, is a office would be harmonious with the existing character of Crutchfield Street and a logical use of the property. Certainly more logical at this point than residential uses, given its uh, neighbors on Crutchfield Street and its location at the corner of Duke Street, which is already a very heavily traveled thoroughfare and only getting more so all the time. Not exactly an attractive place to build homes. I encourage you to consider the compatibility, logic, and on-the-ground reality and vote to approve the requested land use change and rezoning. Thank you, and I'm going to pass the baton to Dan Jewell. Thank you, Mr. Wise. Mr. Jewell? Mr. Mayor, I just want to mention real quick that it's also nice to see Mr. Wise back in these chambers. He's spent is. quite Thank a bit of time you. here as well. Yes, as reporter for exactly. the Herald Thank you for that. You're right, Mr. Councilmember Reese. We're glad to have you back, Jim. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Mayor and members of the Council, for you hanging out uh, this evening as well. Uh, my name is Dan Jewell. I'm a landscape architect in private practice. I reside at 1025 Gloria Avenue, but unlike most of the times I am up before you, uh, I am not uh, the applicant on this project, nor am I actually working on this project as a consultant. Rather, I have several friends who belong to the lodge, and they ask me if I would mind getting up saying a few words uh, on behalf of their request particularly since there were some comments that came out of the Planning Commission meeting uh, having to do with uh, the lack of a development plan, which uh, if you read those comments, you know would, was the basis for uh, some of the folks who, who chose to recommend against the case. Uh, development plans are very expensive. The development plans cost anywhere from Thirty-five to sixty-five thousand dollars and up. I think uh, the other consultants in the room can attest to that. George Stanzial does them cheaper. Yeah, he does. I don't know about that. <laughs> we'll uh, we'll 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 get into a wrestling match about that a little bit. So uh, we'll 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 see. He drives a better car than I do. I'll just point that out to you. <laughs> the uh, uh, and if there's a traffic impact analysis involved, it can it can go up from there. The uh, the other thing with a development plan is it adds time. A rezoning like this, a straight request. Uh, can be done in five to six months. Development plan zonings take at least 10 months, more likely 12 to 14 months, depending on the complication of the case. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say is the development plans are warranted in many cases. They're warranted where there's uh, concerns over the from the neighbors. They're warranted where you have a large project. They're warranted where you have a complicated project where things need to be thought out ahead of time, road access, uh, transition scale to the surrounding community. Uh, uh, different uses, things of that nature, particularly mixed-use projects. But when you have a very small piece of property like this, uh, where there has been no neighborhood opposition, and as Mr. Wise said, there is clearly a, uh, a gap along the street that is all zoned office on both sides and across the street with some remnant residential that we have, have here. Uh, 
then it is not necessarily warranted to have a development plan. Finally, I would like to add that uh, given some of the commentary from the Planning Commission that you could build up to a 90-foot building on this site, uh, that is true purely from the zoning, but uh, I did a, a, a little site plan sketch. I do that from time to time, as some of you know, and what the parking, the parking uh, that's required really drives the size of a building that might be built on this site. And what I was able to come up with, even just an ugly site plan, maxing it out, uh, was about a 32,000 square foot, 33,000 square foot maximum building size on all floors. So that would equate to uh, maybe one two-story building or a couple of two or two and three-story buildings. Uh, there's no way that somebody's gonna get build a parking deck in this part of Durham. The economics just don't support that. The site is too small. So uh, I will just wrap by saying development plans are appropriate in most cases. In this case, we don't think it was warranted. I don't think it was warranted. And I think the fears of a large-scale development just will not bear out in the site because of the small size of it. Uh, thank you, and with that, I'd like to close it Close it by adding, uh, ha handing it over to uh, Joe Hackett with the Lodge. Thank you very much, Mr. Hackett, welcome. Yes, sir, glad to be here. Uh, thanks, thanks for hanging with us. Okay, now I got three more minutes, I can use all of it, right? Mm -hmm. No, I'm just kidding, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, I have been chosen to speak on behalf of the Masons here in Durham for this thing. It is a... To us, it's a necessary thing. As most of you probably know or may not know, we do a lot of charity work. We, we run a couple of different orphanages in, in the state, a retirement home. Uh, we do eye foundation work, giving people free eye exams and different things like that. And this is it's just a necessary thing for us to be able to build us a home. And that's what we're looking for. Um, I have brought several Masons here with me tonight to for support, I'd like y'all to stand up just to Thank stretch, you. if nothing else, you've been here so long. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hackett. I hope you all got a nap during the earlier part of the meeting. Um, so, um, are there any, is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this, on this uh, case? Anyone else that would like to be heard? Either proponent or opponent? Yes, sir. Please come forward, state your name. State your name and address. Are you a proponent of this? Uh, no, I'm for it. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> okay. Same thing. Okay, look, see that clock over there? Okay. You got two minutes two and 20 minutes. seconds. My name is Rodney Bradshaw. I'm a past master of Shepherd Moore Lodge number 840. Uh -huh. And I'm very close friends. First, I'd like to say good evening to all the council. It's been a long night. But I'm a very close friend of a lot of the brothers of Fellowship Lodge. They come to visit our lodge on Cook Road. And uh, after knowing them for two years, I just recently found out that they didn't actually have a lodge. They actually rent a place that they go to over near Northgate Park to have their meetings, which is very, very small. So I look at this uh, being an opportunity for them to be able to build a lodge, a great thing. I don't want to bring religion into it, but... It's no different than uh, Muslims having a mosque to go to or Christians having a church to go to or people just having different places that they would like to meet. So I think this is very important for the community and not making it a black and a white thing. Lots of people don't know that white masons can come to the black lodges, blacks can come to the white masons lodges in the state of North Carolina. That was something that was passed about 10 years ago. So this is a, when I was in the chairs worship master, this is a, it's a relationship that I took and built with this lodge, and we're here tonight to support them to show that we're all one, no matter what color it is. We're all one when it comes to masonry, and we also do a lot of different things in the community and make different donations to the orphanage children home. So I just think it would be a good thing for the council to vote upon this, for them to have somewhere to go. It's just like not having a house to go to at night or, or different things like that. And I just want to say, uh, if you give them the opportunity, I know it would be a good situation for the Durham community. Thank you very Thank much, you. sir. Much appreciated. All right, is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this matter? Anyone else that would like to be heard on this matter? All righty. Um, if not, uh, any, any, I'm going uh, to, if not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed, and the matter is back before the council. Council members, any questions, comments? I just have a few for staff. Mm -hmm. 
Go ahead, Council Member Freeman. I just wanted to just <laughs> highlight, so I'm noticing a trend with the approval of rezoning without a developer or development plan. And I just wanna make sure that I highlight that this process works well for developers and it works well for property owners as individuals. And um, it really is the piecemeal approach that we've been talking about, which has been harmful across this city. And uh, I wanna make sure that we note that, I mean, I'm not saying that this project is not, you know, it's small enough where it won't have as huge of an impact, but I wanna recognize that we do have an upcoming case with, with the Old West Durham uh, conversation around how a neighborhood is trying to do some small area planning and recognizing that their community is shifting and changing in a way that they're not comfortable with. And then this is, this is the opposite of that. And I just wanna highlight that for folks. Thank you, council member. Any other questions or comments? I do have a couple. Uh, one of them uh, regards the comment by Planning Commissioner Ghosh. Um, and and I, I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm not gonna try to get you guys to answer these tonight, Jacob, but let me just, I'm gonna say two things and Pat's here, you all can listen to it and do what you want with it. Uh, but I thought he had an interesting comment about there, the idea that work on amending the UDA to allow, UDO to allow for zoning conditions to prohibit uses and further restrict dimensional requirements like height without the need for a development plan. I don't know if that's a sensible approach, but it struck me as in this case, it might have been exactly the kind of thing that would have been useful. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how often it's useful in cases, but I'll just mention that for your future consideration. And then similarly, Tom Miller in his comment said, these cases point out the weakness in our OI zone the one size fits all category allowing a very wide range of uses and in pretty intense developments. Most municipalities have more than one OI zone allowing for different intensities based on context. Again, I thought those were both just very thoughtful, interesting comments that might be useful going forward. Um, so now you've heard them from me. They may not be useful going forward as well, but um, they, I, I thought that they had good possibilities. If I might very briefly, Mr. Mayor, Pat Young with the Planning Department, I just want to appreciate you for making those comments and let you know that those are both things we discussed internally about looking at as part of a update of the comprehensive plan process. We could decouple those and do those earlier, but they both have a lot of merit and we'll evaluate them fully. Thank you. I'm not trying to get you to do them earlier, but thank you. I also want to appreciate, we, I got a very useful email from Council Member Reese today on this case. Uh, do you want to talk about that at all? Absolutely, Mr. Mayor. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'll be, I'm, I intend to vote for the matter on our doc, on our agenda tonight, but I was, I was not inclined to support it uh, when, the, when these items first came through our agenda at the last work session and reviewed them, uh, simply because I shared the plan, some of the planning commissioner's concerns about a lack of a development plan and what could be put on this site and how that would impact the neighborhood. I had, a, had an opportunity to sit down uh, with Dan Jewell uh, who spoke with us tonight, and he um, kind of walked me through the analysis that I, quite frankly, don't have the skills and ability to do, uh, to figure out exactly what could be built on that uh, piece of property under current uh, UDO requirements. He was kind enough to uh, send that to Jacob Wiggins with the, with the planning department, and uh, I followed up with Jacob uh, this morning, who uh, knew exactly what I was talking about and um, agreed with uh, Dan's assessment of what could be done. I think the maximum building that can be built on that site given parking and setback requirements is somewhere in the neighborhood of 33,000 square feet or thereabouts. Um, and it'd have to be surface parking because structured parking makes no sense in this neighborhood. Um, and so I think that gave me a lot more comfort about the fact that even though we can't guarantee the specific use that the uh, that folks have talked about uh, this property being used, that whatever ends up happening with this site, and I don't, I don't question the motives of the folks who are seeking to use this transaction, I just know that stuff happens, you know, uh, transactions go sideways. Um, but no matter what happens with this property, it, it can't match up with some of the, I think, concerns that the number of the planning commissioners quite rightly raised at the, at the uh, planning commission. Um, and so I shared that with my colleagues because I thought that would be helpful um, given that, that a number of the planning commissioners who voted against this matter, the planning commission raised that as a concern. I just really appreciate um, both Dan Jewell for spending the effort to do this uh, kind of, I won't call it back of the analysis because you actually had a little map, you actually did some work. Um, and especially the, 
folks at the planning at the planning department, Jacob, for for taking this up and and taking a look at it. We appreciate that work. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, Councilmember Reese, and also uh, I, I thought the analysis was also extremely <coughs> extremely persuasive. I agree. Any other comments, questions? All right. I, I, yeah, go ahead. I just want to say that uh, while I would support the rezoning, I would like to. Um, explain that I am not supporting the UDO change based on the fact that we need to address this as a comprehensive focus. And I don't know any other way to demonstrate that in a way that's uh, impactful other than voting no. So I just want to make sure that I share that with you guys. Thank you. All right, council members. Uh, the, I, I believe I've already closed this public hearing, uh, but if not, I do now. And uh, the matter's back before the council. Uh, the we're first motion we've been asked is to adopt a resolution amending the future land use map to establish office as the site's designation. So moved. Second. All righty. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much. And the second motion is to adopt a consistency statement as required by NCGS 160A-383. So moved. Second. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. Please open the vote, Madam Clerk. Close the vote. Motion passes 5-1 with um, Councilmember Freeman voting no. Thank you very much. And now mo uh, motion number three to adopt an ordinance to amend the UDO to take property uh, out of the residential urban RU, urban five RU five zoning district and establish the same as office and institutional for the subject site. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Um, Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Close the vote. Motion, motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much. And now we will move to consolidate item 43718 North Roxborough Street. Um, and uh, let me just say to our friends, our, our friends from the Masonic Lodges, we appreciate your being here. We wish you the best in whatever new home that you end up with. Yeah. Uh, we'll now move to consolidated item 43718 North Roxburgh Street, and we will hear from staff. Hello, Jamie. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Jamie Sunyak with the Planning Department. <clears throat> a request for future land use map amendment and zoning map change has been received from Withers Ravenel for a 1.28 acre parcel located at 3718 North Roxborough Street. <clears throat> the Flum Amendment, future land use map amendment, would change the current designation of <coughs> office to commercial. The applicant requests to change the zoning of the subject site from office and institutional to commercial neighborhood with a development plan. Key commitments on the development plan associated with this request include a maximum building size of 20,000 square feet, prohibiting indoor and outdoor recreation uses, and prohibiting retail uses who primarily sell alcoholic beverages. Their additional commitments are screening for any drive-through lanes, uses with drive-through lanes, limiting the hours of operation of restaurants, and constructing a bus pullout and shelter on the east side of North Roxbury Street adjacent to the site. The Planning Commission considered this request at their February 13th, 2018 meeting and re recommended approval of the request by a vote of 14 to zero. Staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Action on this item will require three separate motions and votes, one for the FLAM amendment, one for the consistency statement, and one for the zoning ordinance. I will be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much. You have heard the report from staff. I'm now going to declare this public hearing open. First, are there any questions for staff by members of the council? Again, uh, oh, sorry. Thank no, you. please go ahead. The, in, uh, the Planning Commission comments, I guess, again, are we dealing with the same error? It says the Planning Commission finds that the ordinance request is not consistent with the adopted comprehensive plan. However, should the plan and amendment be approved? It's not? The, the staff finds that it's not consistent with the comprehensive plan because the FLOM isn't consistent gotcha. with the zoning. Once the FLOM, which the, once the future land use map 
is amended, then it would be consistent. Got you. Okay, mm -hmm. I got you. It's, it's late. Sorry. Thank, Thank you. <laughs> that is actually, that, inf that, that language has been confusing to me since the day I got here. Oh, uh, I, I don't feel as bad. Then. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> Question. Uh, okay. I'm glad um, I could help. But, <laughs> but, but, I, but, I, but it's, it's necessary and I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, any other questions by members of the council at this point? Uh, if not, we have two speakers signed up uh, to speak uh, on this on item 24. Uh, we have Joshua Rinke. I'm sorry, I can't read your handwriting. And David F. Brown. Um, Joshua Rinke is a proponent. Is Mr. Brown also a proponent? You are. Okay. Uh, please come forward, and um, I will give you six minutes, and I hope you don't take it all. All right, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, we appreciate that. We'll try to take less than a minute. Uh, Joshua Ranke, a registered professional engineer in the state of North Carolina uh, from Ramey Kemp and Associates, worked on the traffic impact analysis for this, um, scoped it with the city and DOT, uh, reviewed by the city and DOT. It was determined that no uh, roadway improvements were necessary to mitigate the traffic impacts of this of this development. Thank you. And I'm willing to answer any questions you have. I hope you got paid by the hour tonight. <laughs> okay. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. My name is David Brown. I'm the director of planning at Withers Ravenel. I'm actually here on behalf of my colleague, Don Mazel, who is at another hearing tonight. Uh, just as Josh just stated, we're here to answer any questions. I think staff gave you an excellent summary. Uh, we'll try to be brief. You've had a long evening. Thank you very much. All right, is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this item? Yes, sir. Please come forward, state your name and address. My name's Andrew George. Uh, oh, I forgot my address. 209 East Rockway Street, sorry. Just down the street from the proposed development. Uh, I just wanna make a couple <laughs> comments that I walk my dog past this development every day. Um, it's currently an abandoned lot that is wooded, that is covered in trash most of the time. Um, while I obviously have um, an understanding for the, the homelessness in Durham, it is also occupied by homeless inhabitants as well on a number of occasions um, and just generally support active investment in this property area. That being said, I also wanted to um, thank the, the council for their dealing with the prior um, discussions tonight. I know you guys have had a long night. Um, and I just pre pre appreciate your thoughtful um, feedback and the way that you've handled a lot of the issues that have come before you today, as well as these, so. Thank you. Sir, before you leave, would you, would you please go to the clerk's desk and fill out one of those yellow cards just so we'll have a record of you speaking? Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this matter? Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this matter? All righty. Um, any, any questions by counsel for the applicant? Just one. Councilmember Freeman. So I noted that the BPAC was requesting a pad for the bus stop. Did you guys make a determination that that was not feasible or you just skipped it? How did that? I'm sorry. I'm going to defer to staff for just one moment. It's on here. But, uh, Jamie Sonyak with the planning department. It is listed as a text commitment on the cover sheet of the development plan. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, text commitment number five. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. All right. Any more questions for the applicant or staff? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. Uh, can I have a motion to adopt the resolution amending the future land use map to commercial for the subject site? So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, can you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 6 0. Thank you. We need a motion now to adopt a consistency statement. Move to adopt consistency. Second. Been moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, can you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. And now motion, the third motion to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO by taking the property out of the office and institutional, et cetera. And um, 
Can I have a motion? So moved. Sorry. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Close the vote. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Thank you all very much. Uh, and now we'll move to item 25, consolidated annexation item for 3404 Page Road. Yeah, and we will hear from staff. Good evening, Jamie Sonyak again with the Planning Department. This is 3404 Page mm. Road. <clears throat> the request for a utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation, plan amendment, and zoning map change have been received from Stewart Inc. for one parcel totaling 32.87 acres. The subject site is located at 3404 Page Road. This annexation petition seeks to bring in the parcel into the existing city limits. The subject site is presently zoned rural residential and the applicant requests a zoning designation of planned development residential 5.788 with a maximum of 190 townhouse units. The parcel is currently designated as industrial and the applicant has requested an amendment to the low medium density residential category. That's four to eight dwelling units per acre, which would be consistent with the zoning change. Approval of the annexation petition, plan amendment and zoning would be effective, would become effective on June 30th, 2018. Key commitments on the development plan associated with this request include a 20 foot buffer along the southern and western mm -hmm. property lines, additional asphalt for a bicycle lane, sidewalks um, and Page Road widening to a three lane cross section between Mac Paver's driveway and logistics way. Um, and there is also additional building offset uh, to buildings with four units or more and a stream crossing shown on the development plan. The project will be served by County Sewer. The Public Works and Water Management Departments have determined that the existing water mains have the capacity for the proposed development. The Budget and Management Services Department um, have determined that the proposed annexation will become positive, revenue positive immediately following the annexation. Additional information on that can be found in the staff report. The Durham Planning Commission at their January 12, 2018 meeting recommended approval of the proposed future land use map designation and the planned development residential zoning um, by a vote of 10 to zero. Staff determines that this request, um, that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan should the form be amended. Four motions are requested for this application. The first is required by law to approve the utility extension agreement and the voluntary annexation petition. The second is requested uh, to adopt the, the resolution amending the <coughs> land use map designation. And the third is to adopt a consistency statement. Did I say this twice? Let me repeat myself again. The fourth, mo there's four motions required. The first is the utility extension, uh, voluntary annexation petition. The second is for the FLOM. The third is for the consistency statement. And the fourth is for the zoning. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer questions that you have. I only see three. Four spot listed on me. I only see three motions uh, on ours. So when we get to that, you'll have to help us out. Okay. okay? I will. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much for that report. Um, you all have heard the staff report, and now I'm going to declare this public hearing open. And I'm going to first ask council members if you have any questions for staff. Quick question. Uh, do you know the price point of the townhouses? I do not. The applicant is here and can answer that. Okay. All right. I'll wait. Okay. Um, and then uh, any other questions for staff? I'll ask staff a question. Do you have any concerns about giving up our limited supply, some of our limited supply of land designated for industrial use on the future land use map? In this location, I would say that the change from industrial to, to residential makes sense um, based on the adjacent, based on the development that's occurring in that area. If you look at the aerial that was provided in the staff report, as well as um, there was a supplemental aerial that was provided to you um, by planning director earlier today, you can see the trends of development in that area. Um, there are a number of 
uh, planned development residential applications that are that have been built and that are under construction. So I, I feel that in this location, um, given the proximity and and the way that the adjacent properties have been built within anticipation of connection. If you look at Anthropology Drive, there uh, is an anticipated connection to the property to the north, um, and it makes sense to have that residential as, as opposed to an industrial use. I think there would be a lot um, more outcry in terms of uh, incompatibility. So um, for this particular site, I do think it makes sense. I think that Director Young has a comment as well. Uh, as ever, Ms. Sonia, I gave an excellent answer, but I did want to just briefly elaborate on that. Back in 2012, mm -hmm. Planning Department, working with the uh, Durham Chamber and a number of other partners, uh, conducted an um, industrial land study. And we are going to, uh, through our proposed work program for the coming fiscal year, we're going to update that. Right. And uh, we'll look very carefully at the issue I think you're indicating here, which is we do have um, a risk of running out of quality industrial land over the next 30 years. But I certainly do agree with Ms. Suniak that this specific site, because of the large preponderance of residential development nearby, Thank you. Uh, is, is suitable for residential, not industrial. OK. You guys are good. Just a quick question. Mm -hmm. yeah. Council Member Freeman. So I just want to make sure if, well, I just want to ask the question, are we looking at Page Road and, I guess, recognizing that you're changing a lot or changing, we are changing a lot of the industrial land to residential, how are we gonna pretty much address the traffic or address, what is the time frame that we're looking at in addressing that Page Road overflow, I guess you would say? Um, Council Member Freeman, I'll, I'll let Mr. Judge from Transportation talk about the transport traffic issue. I did wanna just clarify my earlier comments that we did look carefully at the industrial land study and none of the property on this portion of Page Road, there was some property in the very southern portion of Page Road qualified as prime industrial or high quality industrial land. But in terms of the traffic impacts, I'll turn it over to Mr. Judge. Thank you. Uh, yes, Bill Judge, Transportation. Uh, this particular development plan was under the threshold requirement for traffic impact analysis. So it did not prepare one, but they, uh, we, the city and the NCDOT did require widening for left turn lanes at the at the proposed site access. So uh, those are being provided. The majority of the roadway improvements in this area are requirements of the Beth Page development, which is immediately adjacent to it. Um, they're in various phases of development. They've completed a number of improvements already in the area, and they still have some additional improvements to, to go in the future. Uh, primarily uh, a widening of Page Road, mostly south of here, with uh, some of the future office or retail phases of that project. Is there any look into an additional parallel road in that area? Because, I mean, the Page Road is the only... Um, well, there is the, uh, through to Beth Page development, there is a uh, Collector Street, uh, Crown Parkway, that um, is partially constructed and underdeveloped and that would continue north into the, um, I guess the towns at Briar Creek up through Roach. So on our uh, Collector Street plan, we do have sort of a parallel road to the, to the west there. Thank you, Mr. Judge. All right, um, any more uh, questions at this point for staff? If not, um, we have one person signed up to speak on this item. Mr. Schunk, I believe it is you. And um, why don't I start by giving you five minutes and hope that you don't take it all. Being the, for the hour that it is and you know, since I was so up We've got more board. items. Just want to let you know that. <laughs> uh, going to ask a question. No pressure. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and fellow city council members. Robert Schunk, 2627 University Drive. I'm here representing Shenandoah Homes. Um, we're here, uh, here to provide uh, 90, 190 townhomes on 32 acres of land. Uh, we did have a, uh, a neighborhood meeting at the beginning of this project. Uh, we had, it was very well attended. The main uh, topic that we discussed at the neighborhood meeting was a request for a, an additional landscaped buffer along the perimeter of the site, as you see here before your screen. Uh, at the neighborhood meeting, we agreed to provide that to the neighbors. Um, Planning Commission voted 10 to 0. 
and provided uh, favorable comments uh, for this project. A um, couple other things to highlight, um, or one other thing to highlight at Planning Commission here, we added some additional architectural commitments to uh, remove the use of vinyl, to uh, use only hardy plank to be consistent with the adjacent development. Also this evening, um, based on my discussions with the, uh, my developer, uh, we're gonna agree to, uh, or we're gonna proffer a donation to the affordable, uh, Durham's Affordable Housing Fund of $35,000. And we'll also uh, contribute uh, as consistent with what we've done before in other projects to provide $500 per additional student added to the, uh, the school system. I'm available for any questions you might have. Thank you for those proffers, Mr. Shank. Um, and to your and for the developer, much appreciated. Um, council members, I believe Council Member Middleton had a question. Mr. Shunk, forgive me if I don't recall. I, we, I believe we met about this project, but could you remind me what the price points are for town homes? Um, if, if you hadn't before, plus or minus the two hundred fifty thousand. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just questions? So I just wanted to ask how you got to the thirty-five thousand. We had provided that sum of money in past projects. Based on? Uh, unit count and uh, consistency, just a, a evaluation of looking at other, other zonings that have been done over the last couple of years. So like I know that the unit count has been like to the 100 and it's been, it's been like 25,000 per 100, something like that. Sound familiar? Uh, Is there a reason I don't why recall it's not that well. closer to 50,000 as opposed to 35? Um, give me a second. Jeff Palmer with Shenandoah Homes. And regarding your question, 35,000 was above and beyond what's required. And that was a donation on our part. And we felt that was quite generous. And you know, we always want to be able to give more, but honestly, it's uh, 35,000 above and beyond already. And how many, how many of these units are going to be affordable to people at 60% lower? Compared to the, the pricing of housing in the area in general, and given the proximity to job centers, 250 plus or minus is actually quite affordable to a lot of other housing options for people in the Raleigh-Durham area. And so um, it's, it's actually in the more affordable range of new housing. None of the housing units will be affordable to people at 60% of the area of any income or less, is the answer. I just want to make sure you know that that none of them would be affordable. I understand. And just so you're aware that 35,000 is kind of an insult. Thank you. I, don't, I do not view it that way. Okay. Um, other questions from members of the council? Comments? Just one additional question. Any other questions? All right. If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing is closed and the matter is back before the council. Um, we have, I believe you said, we have four motions on this. Is that right, Ms. Sonia? Yes, there are four motions. All righty. We'll start we'll, with them with you very we'll, we'll, we, I think we got it. The okay. motion number one to is adopt an ordinance annexing 3404 Page Road to the city. And to authorize city manager to enter to utility extension agreement. I have a motion on that? So moved. Second. Madam Clerk, we open the vote. Close the vote. Thank you very much. Motion passes 5 1 with Council Member Freeman voting no. Thank you. Uh, motion 2 to adopt a resolution amending the future land use map to below medium density residential. Is there a motion? Move to adopt. Second. Second. Uh, Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Close the vote. <clears throat> motion passes 5-1 with Council Member Freeman voting no. Thank you. Motion number three to adopt a consistency statement. Move to adopt consistency. Second. Uh, please open the vote, Madam Clerk. Close the vote. 
motion passes 5-1 with Council Member Freeman voting no. All righty. And the fourth motion, Ms. Sunyak? The fourth motion is the zoning amendment. Right. Taking the property out of RR and going to the plan development residential 5.788. Move to state it and accepting the proffers. Yes. And accepting the proffers. Yeah. I meant to ask, were the proffers uh, made in such a way that you could, uh, could accept them? I uh, see Pat nodding yes. Okay, thank you very much. All right, do we have a motion? Um, we have a motion on the zoning and the proffers? I'll restate my motion. Thank you. Second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Thank you very much. Motion passes 5-1 with Council Member Freeman voting no. Thank you. We'll now move to item 26, public hearing and approval of the draft FY 2018-19 annual action plan. Um, Mr. Johnson, welcome. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, this item is the um, public hearing and the approval of the FY 18-19 annual action plan. I will turn it over to Ms. Will McConyers, Federal Programs Coordinator, to read the uh, particulars into the record. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor Shu, members of council, Wilmer Conyers. The purpose of this public hearing is to receive citizen comments on the draft FY 18-19 annual action plan. The annual action plan specifies how the city will address the housing and community development needs through the use of community development block grant, known as CDBG, home investment partnership consortium, known as HOME, Emergency Solutions Grant, known as ESG, and Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS, known as HOPWA. The U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development has not yet notified the city of its FY18-19 entitlement funds. So for planning purposes, the city expects to receive $1.8 million in CDBG funds, $800,000 in home funds, 165,000 in ESG funds, and 328,000 in HOPWA funds. The annual action plan was made available for review from March 16th through April 17th, 2018. Notice of this public hearing was a properly advertised in the KPASA, Herald Sun, and Carolina Times newspapers, also via a general listserv. As a recipient of CDBG, HOME, ESG, and HOPWA, the city is required to hold at least two public hearings. The first public hearing was held on December 18, 2017. An application workshop was also held on December 12 for the release of the applications for HOME and ESG funds. The application submission deadline was February 2, 2018. Because final entitlement amounts have not yet been announced, grantees will have at least 60 days subsequent to the entitlement announcement or August 16th, 2018, whichever comes first. In closing, a summary of comments from this public hearing and written comments received throughout the development of the annual action plan will be incorporated into the final plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. You all have you have heard the report from staff. Thank you, Ms. Conyers. And I'm now going to declare this public hearing open. Uh, and I'm going to first ask if there are questions for Ms. Conyers from members of the council. Just one question. Um, you mentioned a list of uh, advertising. Is there a reason you're listing KPASA first? Is that like, is that new? They were listed in the order in which they were advertised. March 15th, 16th, and 17th, respectively. Thank you. Ms. Conyers, um, attachment F or 7, depending upon how you look at it, you have the funding chart. Where are the 10 Durham Community Land Trustee apartments in Southwest Central Durham? What, what are we referring to there? It's uh, an attachment F. Um, there are 10 DCLT apartments in Southwest Central Durham, but I wasn't sure what they were. Are they scattered sites or? Yeah. 
Take your time. We are uncertain at this time whether okay. they're a scattered site or with a cluster. Let me know. Send me an email. Staff will follow up yeah. with you. Not, not, that's not, not urgent. Thank you. Um, about $1.4 in CDBG money went for site prep and loan repayment in Southside. And I think about 570000 of that was in Section 108 loan repayment. And I'm wondering, about how many more years do you know that we have to have for that Section 108 loan repayment? The Section 108 loan is for 20 years, and if my memory serves me correctly, I believe we're in our third year. Okay. Thank you. Not the answer I was hoping for, but I, I knew it was not a good answer, but I didn't know it was quite that bad. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, of the $1.4 uh, in CDBG money for the South Side, about $805,000 per page 26 of the report is for site prep. Is this for Beeman Place? Mr. Mayor, uh, yes, that is for Beeman Place. Are we going forward on that plan for single-family homes then, Reginald? So our plan is to issue another uh, RFP that we hope to go out uh, probably the next 45 to 60 days. Uh, as you know, there are some challenges with that site, but yes. we do have a commitment to the community that we will uh, complete that uh, project. We are exploring some other options based upon the results of the RFP that, was, that came back uh, earlier this year. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so let me just say, are we committed to single family homes there? Are we, are we putting, is it going to be some flexibility in the RFP? Or? There are, is going to be some flexibility, but it will not be multi-family. Okay. Thank you. Um, also, about $367,000 in home dollars is listing for housing rehab with the recipient listed as uh, Department of Community Development. How are these, how do we use those housing rehab funds? Do we have a subcontractor on that or is that, this is on uh, the funding chart as well. Again, Wilmer Conyers, um, they will be bidded out and based on the city's, the department's policy, we can spend up to $50,000 per unit, and with that said, we anticipate completing approximately seven units. Okay, so that's different than, than the uh, $300,000 in Habitat Home Repair Funds, which is out of, the, uh, out of the dedicated funding source. Is that right? That is correct. Thanks. On page 20 of the report, number four, there's $13.8 million in CDBG funds spent in Southside. Do you see where I'm, I'm looking at that in uh, page 20 of the report, item four? It says there's $13.8 million in Southside. Uh, do you see that, that, that line, CDBG funds spent in Southside? That appears to be a typo. Okay. Because I was going to ask you over what period of time that was. So, all right. Do you have an idea what the real number might be? Because I thought that was either multi-year or a typo. Anyway, you just let me know. You should be glad I read this thing this carefully, Reginald. I'm, old, I'm better than the federal government. Okay. Um, and then on page 21, number eight, uh, $900,000 in home funds. And I was wondering again, over, over what period of time is that spent? The intent is to spend it, expend it within the one year um, funding period. Okay. And that would be a combination of 800000 in home funds and 100000 in program aid. Program income. funds, right. So my final question is, how do you handle recusals of CAC members who might be voting on funds for their own organizations? Is there, do people recuse themselves routinely? That is correct. Okay, thank you. All right, those are my questions. Other council members, other questions? Just one. Council member Freeman? 
Uh, so specifically to um, Mayor Schul's point, with the 367,000 uh, that is going to be bidded out, is there a, any room for conversation about how that low priority of economic development can be included in that? Would you elaborate just, uh, council member? So just recognizing that if there's an opportunity to do some apprenticeship or some type of work program along with OEWD, like is there room to do that in this time, like in the time frame, I realize it's probably short. That's that something that we can have conversations with OEWD about. We've been having some conversations with them on other matters, so we would include that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, council member. Okay, uh, we have four member, four people signed up to speak on this, but I don't believe any of them are here. Is that correct, Laverne? Thank you. We, they left us some written comments, which uh, I will make available with the clerk. Great. All right, uh, is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item? Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item? If not, uh, I will declare the public hearing closed. Uh, and the matter is back before the council. I believe that we can do all this in a single motion. Is that, do you agree? Yes, you, you yeah, may it's do not it a, in not a single a, motion. Great. So uh, can I have a motion? Will someone please move this item? So moved. So, second. And moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Close the vote. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. And now we'll move, we have two more items left. Longest meeting in, no. since I've been on the city council. Mm -mm. We had no a longer way. one. No, Mr. Mayor. Really? Yeah, okay. Go second longest. Me. Item 27. <laughs> gonna pull out the date. Public hearing to consider adopting a resolution rescinding a previously ordered sewer main and outfall to serve Red Coach Road and Grand Oaks Road. Mr. Joyner, welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Shule, members of the council. I'm Robert Joyner, Public Works Department. Item 27 is to hold a public hearing to consider adopting a resolution rescinding a previously ordered sewer main and sewer outfall to serve Red Coach and Grand Oaks Roads. Mm -hmm. Staff recommends that council conduct a public hearing, receive comments, and adopt a resolution rescinding this previously ordered petition <sighs> improvement. I'll be happy to answer any questions council may have. Thank you very much. Uh, you have heard the report from staff. I'm now going to declare this public hearing open. And first, I'm going to ask, are there any questions for staff by members of the council? <clears throat> All right. Uh, if not, then we have four speakers signed up for this item. Uh, let's see. Um, I see. I, I guess. I, All right. So... Um, I think all these people are opponents of the of this. I think all the people here want the, or at least three of the people, want the uh, sewer extended and not rescinded, uh, although it doesn't say proponent or opponent on here, but I think I get it. Uh, they are Kelly King, Terry Jones, and Darian Raposa, and then we have uh, David Furr here from the public staff of the NC Utilities Commission. Um, Mr. Furr, how would you characterize yourself? As a proponent or opponent or opposed to it? So are all the other speakers opposed to the rescind rescinding of this? Is, am I correct on that? Okay, that's what I thought. All righty. Um, I'm going to um, give the, uh, give the, well, first of all, is there anyone else that, is, that wants to speak on this matter? Okay, are you opposed to it also? Opposed. All right, you also are opposed, okay. So what I'm gonna ask the two of you all to do now, if you wouldn't mind, is to go over to that table and fill out the yellow card. Do that right now, okay? So we can get this thing going. All right, and then um, I'm gonna call you all later, but uh, there are six speakers. I'm gonna give the, uh, do you all feel that 12 minutes would be enough for all of you all? I'm hearing a no. Okay, I'm gonna give you 15 minutes and I'm gonna hope you don't take it all. Um, but if you need to, you can have it. And uh, I'm gonna begin with, with a Darian Raposa. <coughs> so 
I was unaware that um, PowerPoint was available. I made handouts. Is it permissible for me to pass them out? Do a hand of the clerk. That would be great. Thank you. So, uh, oh. Darien Raposa, 1824 Grande Oaks Road. It's missing an E. Um, I, as you saw from my card, I put opposed question mark. Um, I have a fourth version. Uh, we're presented with three options in the letter. I have a, a fourth version, which I think would save um, either the residents or the city or both of us, a couple million dollars. That'd be so good. I'd, I'd like that to be considered. Um, so um, in the interest of time, I'm going to start with the punchline, and then I'd like, uh, like your, to allow me to give a little background. Um, in the handout that I, that I made, the yellow outline is the outline of the proposed sewer um, uh, install, um, construction project. The neighborhood, um, mistakes were made when the development occurred. Um, the neighborhood has a combination of some properties that have um, septic systems and most of us have a septic tank with a grinder pump in it, and the um, effluent is daisy chained up the hill, after which there's a gravity fall and it goes into the package plant. The package plant was in great disrepair, and since the, um, in 1993, Diener closed the, it, Diener had sent out a threatening letter saying they would condemn the neighborhood. In 2007, things came to a head again. We got another threatening letter. I hadn't, been, I wasn't there in '93. And 2007, there was another threatening letter. We had to take action right away, or the neighborhood was in danger of being condemned. I had professional things going on, so I haven't given you the benefit of my uh, insights prior to this evening. Um, the oh. Go ahead, Mr. Okay, so um, to uh, in a nutshell, the, this is proposed. The proposal is to put in a standard sewer system that, where every house would uh, link up to the sewer system, and there's uh, two drainage outfalls. A brand new sewer system, the way neighborhoods should be built, no question about it. Um, however, uh, look. It, Faced with the possibility, as the letter says, that a trebling of the cost, my estimates were 17,000. Treble that is over 51,000 in assessments. If it were option three, I think that's just absurd. Um, I um, wanted to propose that uh, there, there really doesn't seem to be any reason in my mind why the existing daisy chain granted less than ideal system needs to be replaced at all. There's a package plant um, right at the beginning of my short pink line. That's where all the effluent currently uh, gets just fine. It has been uh, since we first, since the neighborhood was first notified in 93. Um, the, uh, um, it, it, all, it, it all successfully gets to the package plant and the new neighborhood with no colored lines on it uh, has, been, has since been built. So I can't understand why in the world we would spend, um, if I understood the letter correctly, $3 million putting in the sewer system with the yellow lines when all the effluent already makes it to the package plant, the little pink square, and the, all, all, it seems to me that the only thing necessary is to connect, to connect from the package plant to the 
um, sewer system that's already in the line within city limits. Mr. Raposa, thank you very much. I'm, I, I hear you. We've got this, and eventually we'll ask staff about it. I'm a little bit worried about the time here. So how would you feel about giving up now and let us hear from some other folks? I, I'd just like to conclude by yeah. saying um, if my alternative proposal is not smiled upon, that I do feel that the you know, city made an obligation to us, that this is a, a, it's already a tremendous burden for, for the size of this assessment. And I think that the city um, needs to stick to, its, uh, stick to its word. The only reason the project was delayed was um, the city's shortcomings. Thank you, Mr. Reposa. Now we'll hear from Kelly King. My name is Kelly King, 5611 Red Coach Road. I've spoke on to this count to the council several times on this. Of course, the, the things that's happened this afternoon has kind of changed my thoughts. So I will have to put in my neighbor's part about the pressurized line. We did look at that in 2007. City of Durham does not let you take a pressurized line in their system. They want a four-inch gravity-fed line that they will take over. So all that's been done. You don't even need to look at that. It was rejected in 2007. I was there. Uh, <clears throat> I've gone over the nuts and bolts and the whys and what fours and option two and three, why they're, they're just not going to work. Option two leaves a lot of things open. It's depending on us getting a permit to put in a sewer system. Option two could drag on three, four more years. It's only been almost 11 now. That one could drag on three or four more. Option three is just totally unreasonable. And the main reason I'm here for, now that I've explained in previous meetings why option two won't work, why option three won't work, and everything else, the real reason that I'm here, the reason, real reason I came here to start with, I want my sewer line. My sewer line, the one city council in 2007 promised me, my sewer line, the one that they, we came up here, we talked to them, we got people's names, it was voted on, an agreement was signed, and the document says, and I quote the document, this shall commence as soon as possible. It was all signed. Don't think this is free. This whole neighborhood signed an agreement. We're going to pay part of it. So my part to get my sewer line in, my road frontage is $20,000. So I'm not saying coming up here and saying, hey, city council, why don't y'all give me a free ride? It's going to cost me $20,000 at least when y'all put this line in. All I want is what was promised to me. There's been a lot of statements made here in the activities before the meeting about the city of Durham. These guys that were up here in 2007, they were duly elected officials. They came up here and voted and made a decision on what the city of Durham was going to do based on the majority of Durham voting them in office. They voted to do this agreement. You want to call an agreement? I'm from Durham. I didn't move here from Chapel Hill. I didn't move here from Hillsboro. I didn't come here to inspect, expect anything. I was born in Durham in 1953. We call it a promise in Durham. So now what staff wants you to do is renege on the 2007 city council's promise to these people, to me. Why do they want you to renege on it? to cover up the fact that they failed to do their job. They waited 10 years kicking this to the side, putting in a sidewalk, looking at a railroad station, trying to find a bus depot while my sewage is running in the creek, the Eno River. What'd they do? Well, we're sorry. It's an excuse. It's not a reason. There's no reason why this has not been done there's no reason why this promise hasn't been kept. Some people call agreement. 
I call it a promise. Some people would call it a contract. I don't see what choice you got except to finish the job that your predecessor, duly elected officials, promised to me, Kelly King, they promised me in 2007. And I'm not going to be happy until their promise is kept. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. King. Terry Jones. Terry Jones here. Okay. Elizabeth Plowler. Thank you, Ms. Plowler. Glad to have you. <clears throat> Thank you. I didn't intend to speak tonight, but I felt like my voice needed to be heard. <clears throat> I wanted to take a moment to speak on the behalf of the residents that are new to this neighborhood that had no idea that this was happening until we received letters from the city. <clears throat> Some of the residents were told during their purchasing process about this sewer situation. I was not one of those residents. I know it's always buyer beware when you buy a house. For my situation and my next door neighbor's situation, we had no idea this was even an issue until we got letters from the city. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. <clears throat> Please support option one and follow through on a commitment this council made you many years ago. I feel we do not have the skill or the expertise to do any of what is noted in the other options. Sorry, I lost my place. From what I understand by my neighbors, we came to the city as a final course of action years ago. Please do not turn your back on us now. It would put us at an incredible disadvantage and cause, excuse me, let me rephrase. It would put us at incredibly difficult situation that was caused by matters beyond our control. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Plowler. Freeman Walker, the third. <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor, uh, Council. Good evening. Uh, my name is Freeman Walker III, and I live at 1800 Grand Oaks Road. Um, I want to thank you for your time, and I want to echo the sentiments of uh, my neighbors. Uh, and even though we don't have cookouts and neighborhood fish fries and get together, but they're proud Dermites that are proud of their neighborhood. They work together. We wave at each other. We don't always get in each other's backyard, but we're on the same page with this. Um, when I bought my house in 2000, my daughter was an infant. Uh, she is now a junior in college, doing quite well, I might add. But we're talking about the span of uh, 19 years, and this same issue has been going on. And um, the city did make a promise in 2007, signed agreement, said it was going to be done, and for whatever reason, and I understand how the city works and there's a lot, lot on your plate, just got pushed away. But now it's time to uh, make, make good on that promise. And uh, that's all our, our uh, neighbors are asking, that you be fair and equitable to uh, the folks on Red Coach and Grand Oaks. And I know you will. I believe you will. I've seen it in, uh, in action tonight. So um, I ask that uh, you guys rescind this order and uh, make good on that promise of 2007. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Uh, David Furr. Welcome, Mr. Furr. We're glad to have you back. Thank you for having me back. Um, David Furr with Public Staff Water and Sewer Division at the North Carolina Utilities Commission. Um, the North Carolina Utilities Commission assigned its first emergency operator to this system about 25 years ago. We're now on our fifth emergency operator. Residents are currently paying $112 per month just for sewer utility service, and I believe this to be barely enough just to maintain routine operations. Um, economies of scale are very poor. Uh, as you know, in 2007, the uh, City Council approved a petition to extend sewer lines into this area. Uh, some of the assessments for some of these residents, even with existing petitions, is going to be as much as $30,000 for these sewer lines. They, 
these residents need this service from the city of Durham. Uh, with this project moving forward, a looming environmental problem will be resolved. The city will have additional sewer revenue from these residents. The project <coughs> also extends the collection system across Bivens Road and installs an additional manhole that can facilitate future expansion of the city's sewer system. Residents in the area will have good, dependable city of Durham sewer utility service. This project doesn't happen. HOA will have to be formed to operate this, put in a new treatment plant. Um, these residents do not have the financial, manager, or technical capacity to operate a system of this nature. Uh, the cost will still be the same or higher just to maintain normal operations, but begin to cause poor economies of scale. Uh, and the city of Durham will continue to have an unnecessary do sewer discharge right beside the city of Durham. I request <coughs> council to follow through with the commitment its predecessors made to these residents over 10 years ago and extend the city sewer lines under the current approved petition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fur. Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this item? <coughs> Anybody else that would like to be heard on this item? Okay. Council members, um, any questions for staff at this point or for the applicants, for the uh, speakers, rather? Mr. Mayor. Council member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. Fur, I know I've asked you this before, but um, maybe maybe not this question. Have you ever considered, I mean, did you uh, meet with our staff to talk about this issue before you came tonight? Say that again? Did you meet with our staff to talk about this issue before you came to speak to us tonight? Uh, I have spoken with your staff on several different occasions, not specifically a meeting before this meeting tonight. I've had some discussions with Mr. Joyner in the hallway. Have you, have you ever tried to send us a letter explaining the your position about what's best for these neighbors, these folks? Uh, I do not think I've ever sent you a letter, no. Yeah, I, I expressed this to you the last time you came and spoke to us, so I'm gonna express it to you again, that it's, it seems odd that another entity of government is coming here to lobby us in a public hearing about an action we could take. I understand. When you, you are a person who's perfectly capable of meeting with our staff to express your position that they could put in our staff memo, you can come talk to me anytime in my office, you can send me a letter. Having you at a public hearing seems it just doesn't seem right. <laughs> it's not your fault. You're doing your job as you see it. I respect that. Um, but that's frustrating to me every time you come, and I'm going to continue to be frustrated about it every time I see you at, <laughs> at the podium, just so you know. I understand. Um, understood. And I apologize. Um, There's no... It's not, it's, you're doing what you think you need to do. Um, I just think uh, uh, you could have a more productive role in this process if you tried to sit down with our staff as they're, as they're making these decisions and preparing these memos to get your perspective before us in a different way. That's all I'm suggesting. I understand. Um, Mr. King, I'm, that's all I have for you, thank you. Mr. King, I wanted to take issue with one thing you said, and you don't need to come back up. I'm not gonna ask you a question. I'm just gonna tell you something. Um, uh, you identified the staff as being responsible for you not getting your sewer line, and that's just flat out wrong, sir. I'm here to tell you that's wrong. It's the city council's responsibility to direct our staff about the priorities. Staff make recommendations, staff give us suggestions, it's this body that makes those decisions. So you don't need to be blaming our staff. They were doing exactly what we told them to do. And by we, I mean the elected board, all of them since 2007 and on up, which I've only been on uh, not that long. So. <clears throat> Go ahead, Councilor Bruce. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, sir. Go, go ahead, Councilman Burris. Um, and uh, I don't. Uh, when it's an appropriate time, I'll talk about my opinions on the on the underlying matter. But okay. this was a time for questions. That's so. fine. Any any questions? Uh, any any other questions for staff at this point? I don't have a question. I do want to make okay. So when it's appropriate. All right. Sure. Uh, I do have a question for Mr. Joyner. Uh, and, and I'm really happy to take comments and questions now. I'm sorry, I should have made that clear, but let me just go ahead and ask. Um, since we saw this item before, how much have costs come down as a result of no negotiations with NCDOT? Bear with me just a moment. 
the cost on this item uh, would be roughly two hundred thousand dollars less after the negotiation. So uh, the current estimate was about six hundred is roughly six hundred ten thousand, uh -huh. and before it was around eight hundred thousand. Okay. And then, um, could you comment on the, uh, the gentleman, Mr. Raposa's, uh, the, the, the his, his idea that he presented? Uh, Mr. King uh, remembers that uh, accurately from 2007. That idea was looked at. Uh, the reason it was turned down at the time was because it only satisfies a solution for 13 of the residents. Uh, okay. There are septic systems. Uh, that solution is not possible now under current rules. Okay. So you could not have someone install a grinder pump and do a force main into the public right of way, a private force main into the public right of way in this situation. So that's not something that would be allowed any longer under current rules. Am I correct that option two is quite a bit cheaper than option one for the homeowners and would not require city funding? at least in the way you've presented it. I want to hear from Mr. Furr on that in a minute, but. Uh, yes, sir. The total cost would be less than the total cost spent. Um, the amount of the total assessment, uh, the maximum assessment would be roughly about $377,000. The current estimate, and that is an informal estimate from a company who provides these type of treatment plants, uh, would be about $300,000 is what they're estimating. You may not be able to answer this question, but uh, Mr. Furr characterized the ability of the homeowners to uh, be able to do this as low. Uh, you know that, that it would be hard. You know, I don't know. Maybe maybe even impossible. I can't remember what he said exactly, Mr. Furr. But well, I think the point is, um, I'm not. I don't have any objection to the thought. Uh, Mr. Joyner said in regards to his estimate to put a new plant in, I cannot say if that's correct or not, but I have run numbers on the current operation and basically it would be the same or, or worse even with a new plant as far as just the ongoing daily routine operation of the plant, what it would cost the customers. It's still going to be well over $100 a month per customer. You're saying that continue to operate the plant. That's before any kind of significant repairs going into the future. You want to comment on that, Mr. Joyner? So I would say that it is fairly difficult for homeowners to perform maneuvers like this. They would have to hire experts to help them out. Uh, they would definitely be required to form an HOA uh, under this situation. Um, this is not something that would likely be looked at uh, by the state as a viable option without either a large, much larger supply of houses to fund something like this. Um, and they would have to typically seek uh, somebody, uh, EnviroLink or Aqua or someone to run the treatment plant for them. And that would be a contract that would have to be established beforehand before the state would typically permit something like this under existing <coughs> rules. Are you talking about that for a new construction or? This is brand new construction. In not, this not particular. the existing system? Yeah, the existing system wouldn't fall under those rules. To replace the existing system? Yes, according to the state, they would be obligated to restore the permit under those rules. I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand that. So essentially, because a permit was already granted for the facility, if you were to restore the plant to either active condition or to construct a new plant, uh, the state would grant a permit. Okay, yes. The, currently, right now, there is the permit, the last permit approved has expired. The plant is still operating under the old permit, still meeting those effluent requirements. There's currently an emergency operator the actual emergency operator is Old North State Water Company, LLC. It has an affiliate called EnviroLink, which does contract operations. And in essence, they're acting as the emergency operator at this time. Um, now, when I've run my numbers in regards to what it's costing now and versus what it'll cost in the future, 
The assumption is that in EnviroLink, we continue to serve as a contract operator. Clearly, none of these people have a certified operator that can perform the services of an operator responsible charge for the sewer plant. Um, the nature of the plant, um, I don't know that the plant, a replacement for this plant would actually be the exact same thing because some of the requirements have increased over the years. Might require some additional tertiary filters on the back side. Uh, I don't, I can't speak to what additional costs that might be for the contract operator. Uh, but I have assumed that all the other costs, power, chemicals, effluent, lab testing, permit fees, all the things that go into just the normal cost of operating the plant. And it is no better with a new plant than it would be <clears throat> existing plant. Do you agree with that, Robert? Yes, sir. Other council members' questions? Questions or comments? I do have a comment, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start out with Councilmember Middleton, and then we'll go with Councilmember Reese. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I'll be brief. I, uh, I remember sitting and listening to this issue discussed at a work session right before I was um, sworn in, new council was sworn in, and there seemed to be a bit of a punting of the issue. Um, and I sat there that day. I remember thinking, I mean, we're going to have to deal with this. Um, I'm, I'm really struggling with this because I remember sitting listening to this discussion and the, the phrase, the continuity of institutional integrity kept coming to me. Um, that is, although I wasn't on council when they made this decision, the, the, there seems at least to me to be an issue of, of the integrity of the council as in a universal body or a continual body. Um, I appreciate the, the remarks in the memo that say that our other construction priorities, whatever the language is, um, prevented this job from being done. But I, I find the fact that our predecessors um, at that time who controlled the imprimatur of our city um, and the levers of power of our city committed us to something. I, I find that compelling. Um, my, uh, my friends, my legal, legal friends, I think you guys have some, a, phrase, a Latin phrase called stare decisis, which means let the decision stand. Um, and absent some really compelling or something that shocks our conscience, you know, that, that, that's just so against our values, um, comes up. I, you know, I, I, I think when, when, when um, the city says it's going to do something, I think it should do it. And uh, I find um, the comments from the residents very compelling. Um, as a steward of the city's um, coffers, I'm always looking at what it costs, and I'm always mindful of being a good steward uh, over the city's um, coffers. But I, I just find this compelling. I find the, 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 the residents' concerns and, and the fact that a previous council committed this city to it a compelling. Um, I find it as compelling as residents who want mulch in a park taken up in East Durham, um, who would just find it compelling. I find it compelling. Um, so I'm, I'm inclined to, to honor not to rescind our order, but to um, move ahead with what the city said it was going to do in 2007. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, Council Member. Council Member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, it won't be any surprise to you or the Mayor Pro Tem uh, because you were on the council when last we discussed these types of issues. I think all of our colleagues were at that work session and heard of this conversation, but uh, I agree with Council Member Middleton about our obligations here. Um, and I do support uh, option one that the city's presented to us. First of all, I want to thank all of the uh, folks who live in this part of, this, uh, of the county who have stayed five hours uh, to have their uh, case heard. Appreciate your... Um, willingness to stick it out and your trust in us that we would get to it and give you a fair hearing. Um, I also really want to thank staff for uh, going back to the state DOT and working with them to figure out how we could uh, make the initial estimate somewhat more palatable in terms of how much this is going to cost. Um, I, uh, I, I took issue, Mr. King, with your suggestion that the staff was responsible because we are responsible, ultimately. Um, staff didn't tell the city council, here's what we're going to do. 
They said, here's what we think ought to happen. Here are your options. The city council said, let's do it. So it's our responsibility. The, the fact that this hasn't happened in 11 years um, is the result of setting up priorities by this board. And um, in that respect, it's, it's fitting that the decision comes back to us um, in this context. I, uh, I can't add anything to what Councilmember Council Middleton said, except to say this, there's, I've been convinced by our staff that, there's no, that we are not under a legal obligation to do this because the resolution we passed did not set a timeline. It did not set a particular time when this would be done. Um, but I'm as convinced as I was when I first read about these issues that we have a moral obligation um, for the very reasons that Councilmember Middleton said uh, to move forward and provide you with your sewer line that we promised you in 2007. Uh, the fact that it's more expensive sucks for us um, but uh, we're just going to have to move forward. That, that's official legal language, by the way. Um, you can, I'll give you the citation later. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. <clears throat> Other Council Members? It must be the midnight hour. Whenever you're ready to move the motion. You want to make a motion? I'd like to. Go ahead. I'd like to make a motion to well, adopt. Hang, hang on a second. We're in, we're in a public hearing here, aren't we? Oh, sorry. We are. Thank you. I'm going to declare this public hearing closed, and uh, matters back before the Council. Council Member Freeman? I'd like to make a motion to adopt the resolution to rescind the previously ordered sewer main and outdoor improvement on Red Coast Road from Bivens Road to the North Bond property line and Grand Oaks Road from Red Coast Road east to the end of the cul-de-sac with the understanding that I intend to vote against that. Thank you. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, could you restate the motion? She has moved to the to approve the staff recommendation that we rescind the um, that we rescind this uh, this um, previously ordered sewer. Maybe. Previously ordered sewer. Thank you very much, Councilman Freeman. And on the and on the and on the same basis, I will second the motion so that we can take a vote on it. Well, Jill, then I will stop talking and vote. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Okay. It's it's okay, Mr. King. Stick with us here. Stick with us here. Okay. The motion is that is that we rescind the uh, previously ordered sewer extension. Any more discussion? The matter is uh, uh, so we're ready for a vote. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. The motion to rescind fails by a vote of two in favor and four against. With council members Shule and Mayor Shule and Mayor Pro Tem Johnson voting in favor. Thank you very much. We'll now move to item 28. Um, Get your sewer. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> item public 28, Mr. Joyner. Good evening, Mayor Shul, members of council. I'm Robert Joyner, Public Works Department. Item 28 is to hold a public hearing to consider adopting a resolution rescinding a previously ordered sewer main to serve a portion of East Gear Street. Staff recommends that council conduct a public hearing and receive comments and adopt a resolution rescinding this previously ordered petition improvement. I'll be happy to answer any questions council may have. Thank you, Mr. Joyner. You've heard from staff. I'm going to declare this public hearing open for the last item of the evening. And I'll first ask if there are any questions for staff. Questions for staff. What was cost prior to negotiations with NCDOT, Mr. Joyner? <clears throat> with me just a minute. Uh, 
545,000. Uh, today's estimate with NCDOT renegotiations is down to 245,000. You're obviously a better negotiator than Donald Trump, Mr. Joyner. Um, good work, as we say. Um, let's see, and then my other question is, I know that we're doing these one at a time. Yes, sir. But we have four more. Yes, sir, that's correct. And can you give me some sense of the relative cost of those? I mean, are they at this sort of size? Or are there, is, there any, is there any giant one lying out there? So um, the next two upcoming will be in the $225,000 range. Mm -hmm. uh, those estimates are almost identical uh, because of the roadway that they lie on. Uh -huh. So there's virtually, there's no change in, in those estimates after the negotiation with NCDOT because of safety concerns and their proximity to a very busy uh, NCDOT roadway. And the, uh, the two then, following that? And the two following that are in the $700,000 and $400,000 range, and those are waterline projects, both. And those will be the last two. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have any, any other questions for staff at this point? We have one speaker uh, signed up, Sheila Eason, Ms. Eason. Uh, and is there anyone else that would like to speak on this matter? Ms. Eason, go ahead. Thank you for coming and thank you for sticking with us. Good evening, Mayor Shule and members of the City Council. Thank you for bearing with us and, and letting us have an opportunity to speak. Um, my name is Sheila Eason. I live at 3325 Summerlin Road, Durham, which intersects with East Gear Street in the affected area. My husband and I, um, about two years ago, purchased some lots on East Gear Street that are undeveloped property, and one of the considerations at that time when we uh, negotiated the price was that city sewer was scheduled to go out there. At that time, we had not received any information, any notification that there was any reason that it would not happen eventually. Um, and so that is one of our concerns is that we do have this undeveloped property that we would like to be able to um, know that sewer is going to happen. Um, the, the other thing has already been stated that I was going to say, and that is just to ask you to please keep the promise that was made. Um, and I don't think I need to elaborate on that anymore. But as um, Councilman Middleton and Councilman Reese said, and I really appreciate what they said, um, I realized that you all were not the people on the, the council at that time, um, but I would ask that you keep that promise that was made to the residents of that neighborhood at that time, um, and that's that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Eason. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, is there anyone else that would like to speak on this item? Um, Ms. Eason, I, I see you're being coached to say one more thing I'm, to you. I'm sorry. My okay. son is here as well, and he owns property in on East Gear Street in the affected area other than the property that my husband and I own. He owns some property there as well. Thank you so very much. He was a... All right, thank you. He, he owned his property before we bought our lots. Okay. So he signed the petition, whereas we did not. Mm -hmm. We would have, but we, we didn't own it at that time. Thank you. All right. Um, council members, any questions or comments? All right. I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and the matter's back before the council. Um, and this is the recommendation is that we rescind the previously ordered sewer main. Do I hear a motion to that effect? I move. Second. 
been moved and seconded that we rescind the previously ordered sewer main. Um, okay, any more, any more discussion? Madam Clerk, would you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion fails two to four with Council, council well, Mayor Shule voting yes and Mayor Pro Tem Johnson voting yes and the rest voting no. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. You have your sewer. Uh, all right. Thank you. Um, Mr. Joyner, thank you. With no more items to come before this meeting, we are adjourned 1207.